Hello, good morning, plant friends. Very early morning here in the Philippines and anywhere else in the world. I want to greet you a happy morning. I hope all of you are having a good time um, this Sunday. Happy 4th of July to our um, U.S. friends. Um, I know it's a big celebration here, uh, there um, today. So I hope you all are enjoying your um, holidays um, and uh, hopefully you can tune in with us. So, um, so far we have 65 viewers uh, and I'd just like to do a shout out to some of our early commenters here. We have John Rowley, um, Techi, Eva, uh, Justin, Kim, Benson, Miguel, Sean, Sean, Heavenly, Melissa, Cherry, Tim, Sean Adams, um, Jenna Julia, thanks for watching. Um, we'll be starting in a few minutes. So, guys, if you can just uh, start sharing uh, this live feed so that, you know, we can engage with... Um, more viewers. Uh, we have a spe very special guest for today. I know you've you you've seen them already um, on our ads. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to start introducing our panelists for this amazing Aloha episode. And let's start with the only rose among the thorn and the owner of Belfiore. Um, succulent collection please give uh, a big warm shout out to miss claire hernandez hi miss claire hi jello hi to all the viewers hey good okay. evening claire. what a very all right, good I'm... <laughs> a very good background <laughs> <laughs> thank you i'm claire hernandez by the way of belfiore succulent collection we are located in the city of Calamba, Laguna. Yeah. Okay. I know a lot of you are a fan of Miss um, Claire. So you'll hear <laughs> her, um, more as we go along um, the discussion. And then another panelist we have, ladies and gentlemen, Brixio Echo. Hi, Brixio. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. How are you today? Hello. I'm good. I'm practicing my English, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Since last hey, so, night. <laughs> yeah, so, Christio, can you, can, you, can you tell us something about yourself so that, you know, our viewers can um, get to know you more before we uh, deep dive into discussing Alo? Yeah, so actually, I'm one of the admins of Alo. Nice to see you. It's a local uh, Facebook group page uh, specific for Alo's, Alo discussion. And then um, I've been uh, a collector also of uh, cactus and succulents uh, for, I think, uh, uh, two or three years already. But I've been a plant hobbyist since uh, my elementary years. And then uh, for now, um, I am more focused on aloes, specifically on the uh, first species and a uh, few uh, hybrids. That's it. Uh, there you go. Thank you for that. And by the way, guys, you have to tune in all throughout the program because at the end of it, we are going to have a raffle from our panelists. And then all the way from Baguio City, the summer camp, the Philippines, please welcome Dan Saklanga. Nicer Dan. Hello. How are you there today? I'm doing good. <laughs> okay, so although most of you, most of the people here know you already, but I know that we are being streamed worldwide. So if you can. Wow. Know. Uh, so I'm Dan Saklanga. I've been collecting since, since 2013. Uh, mostly started with cacti, and then eventually uh, expanded our collections to the rosette types of succulents, like the Echeverias. Uh, I wasn't uh, a big fan of alus when I started, but uh, a year ago, uh, a year ago we started more collecting more because uh, we saw the uh, the 
adaptability of these aloes here in the Philippines. They fit the weather. It's more, they're more tolerant to our hotter climate. So we started uh, collecting more of them and propagating them. So we, uh, we also sell succulents. Uh, and uh, we're now gradually shifting to aloe plants uh, for our Filipino buyers. There. Okay. Thank you, Sir Zan. Uh, we'll hear from you more in, in, a, in a few. And without further ado, and I'm not going to make any introduction, that's why we are having a hard time and our noses are bleeding right now because of this very special guest. <laughs> so, please welcome Kelly Griffin. Hi, Kelly. Um, we, 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 I, Kelly, we can't hear you. Is he on mute? No. I don't know what we're talking about. Probably hmm. the port. Probably the port of your headset got loose. How about now? Yes, oh, there. I can hear you now. There we go. <laughs> Am I working? Yes, it is. So, Kelly, that would have been an interesting you know, introduction if I can talk. <laughs> Say hi to your Filipino fans first. Hi, how are you? Okay, so. Um, can you tell us something more about you, sir? Um, can I tell you more about something? Hmm. Um, <laughs> you asked me some really intelligent questions. You asked me some really intelligent questions, and I, I was listening to what everybody else was saying, and it was kind of uh, a little bit distracting. Um, I've been playing with plants since I was probably about 17, 16, 17, seriously. And I was before that, you know, growing them when I was 10 or 11. So uh, it's been many decades, but uh, uh, I discovered aloes pretty pretty early on. And uh, by the time it was 1980, I'd probably grown my aloe collection to 200, 300 species. Wow, that's, that's a... Huge collection. So probably, I think it's also high time, um, or it's just up, <laughs> you know, because the first part of our segment is actually getting to know um, Kelly, because uh, uh, we know that uh, Kelly has been traveling all around um, in terms of um, searching for for aloes that you know he can uh, breed for us that he can he can discover. So um, right now we're going to proceed to just getting um, Kelly to tell us some story about his journey into collecting the countries that he's been into. So, Sir Kelly, can you walk us through that? Um, sure. In in terms of you know getting into the hybrids, I mean that was just because I was bored because I wasn't on a trip. Uh, I, I started growing more and more plants. Um, as a way of kind of keeping myself busy between trips. But I, I've been to every country that aloes grow in pretty much. Uh, I've been to uh, Yemen and Socotra and uh, Madagascar and South Africa and uh, a little bit into uh, Namibia and um, just looking for the species to study them, to understand them more, to collect pollen, to collect seed uh, so that we could have the, the plants. And then, that gives you a, a heck of a nice paint uh, painting uh, uh, selection when it comes to painting the canvas of creating the hybrids. If you have all the species to work with, you know, if you need one with a yellow flower or you want one with a pink edge or one with a, you know, no thorns or extremely thorny, you'll have more plants uh, at your disposal to work with uh, when you're making, you know, the plants that, you're trying to create that don't exist. Um, most of the hybrids that are really good now um, are the results of many, many crosses. We, we tend to have this concept of, you know, we cross them one time, uh, we've made a hybrid, but by the time you cross one of those hybrids, sometimes they've already been crossed 15 or 20 times. 
So a lot of the hybrids are pretty deep in terms of what's inside them. And by that, I mean many, many species contained within the genetics there. So. I see. So amongst, amongst your trip, um, what's the most exciting one or what's the most challenging one <laughs> that you've ever been to? Or which, which trip uh, were you able to cover your um, best source of aloe? Uh, well, the, the, the best trips are the ones you come back with uninjured and with no sickness. I mean, those, <laughs> those are the greatest ones. Um, but uh, generally, I, I, can, I can say this. My father used to say this all the time. It's not always what you go looking for. It's what you find. And right. I can say some of my greatest discoveries in, in terms of plants have been things that I didn't know I was going to find, but I just kept my eyes open and I looked at everything that I saw there. Um, and, and the other thing is a lot of times species don't look that impressive in the wild. Sometimes they're very diminutive. Uh, sometimes they, they don't look very good. And um, when you get them back in cultivation, you find that sometimes that's the way they look anyway. But sometimes you find they, they grow much better in cultivation. And sometimes you find that there's characteristics within those plants that you can utilize to make something else that you couldn't have imagined if you hadn't had that plant mm. to use. Um, but Madagascar probably is one of the better places because there's just so many species of different sizes and shapes and, and then followed closely by, by South Africa for me. And then mm. you can't miss any of the ones on the extraneous aspects of it. I mean, there are so so many unique aloes all over the, the you know, the place, you know, you think about some of the plant ones from, um, from Yemen, I mean, Enormous and Ruber violacea. I mean, they bring lots of colors to the leaves and, and interesting shapes. So there's, they're all uh, possibilities. And I think that eventually people will use them more and more in their hybrids when they realize what they are. Um, but I uh, hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah. And I think because we are, we are on the other side perspective of it, of it because we are more of like uh, house collectors we're in we, we get the plant um, very few of us actually travel um, to look for actual species so I think it's it's very good to get your perspective from where you got it from the origin because we're, we're really never I think that's one that's one of the uh, good point that you uh, raised because it, it it's really different in terms of how you see it in the wild as how we see it right now mm -hmm. <laughs> after all of your artworks and hybrids. So. Yeah, well, the, the one you have on your on your Facebook page, it's, it's clearly one of the things I, Delta Lights, the reason it got the name Delta Lights was because it has Deltoid Iodonta in it, which is a Madagascar species. And I, there was a, some deference to that, but that shape of the leaf, that's characteristic of a species. And I don't think a lot of people realize that when they're hybridizing the plants because it really isn't relevant. I mean, it, it could be. And Claire's got the one over her shoulder that's a species, so clearly she's going to be able to work with species, and that is kind of cool. The problem with bringing species back into your hybrids is that they sometimes radically change the size of them, and if you were go going for something that was like a, a tabletop or a shelf hollow and you bring in something big, now you've got to breed a couple generations down to get it back to where you want it to be. But by doing so, you might bring in the characteristics that you want, whether that was leaf color or leaf shape or maybe a really pretty flower. So th there are right. a lot of different, different possibilities and um, that's what species give you. And, and when you're into hybrids as deep as I am, probably too deep, I, I see a hybrid and I can tell what's in it. I mean, because I've done most of the crosses. And so when I see something, I immediately go, oh, that's this cross with something. But uh, the thing that kind of nitpicks me a little bit is oftentimes hybridizers have this, this little bit of like uh, de deception to them. And mm -hmm. they'll say, oh, well, that's a parvula hybrid. And I'll go, well, wait a second. Parvula doesn't have any of those characteristics. So how could that be a parvula hybrid? And at least if it is a parvula hybrid, parvula is one of the littlest contributions to it, not the, the most. And so I, I guess for me, I, I just see passing the buck down there. People will be able to build on what I've made and make it better. And clearly some people have done that. Um, but it'd be nice if they said that 
I use this and cross it with that. So right. it makes it easier for other people. Yeah. I, I think that that's the other thing is that there's a little secrecy to it. It's a little bit like, you know, how orchid hy hybrids can be. They can do, oh, well, I can't tell you the parentage, you know. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of time for that because I don't, you know, I, I kind of want to know and don't really want to beat around the bush with it. So when people ask me and I just usually tell them, well, this is what I did. But even if you told somebody what hybrids you crossed to get that plant, they're not going to repeat that cross if it's more than an F1 because the second generation, they're going to pick different plants than you would pick. And each right. individual right. always does that. So when, when you think about something that's like an F10, you know, 10 generations crossed, there's no way that any person is going to recreate it other than probably the person that did it first. Even if they had it meticulously written down what was crossed because the human element of, well, I picked the pinkest one in the group and you picked the bluest one. And and right. so so that, that's where it gets to a completely different uh, avenue, but it, it's a lot like art. You know, when when somebody paints a picture of the Eiffel Tower and they paint it, it looks different than somebody else's interpretation of the same thing. So that's the beauty of it. I think every everybody can make a hybrid. It's just that a lot of the hybrids I see now don't look like much different than what's already out there. So that that's where I think the the bar has to be kind of pushed a little higher. Is that you got to kind of call it and say, well. Maybe maybe that that's nice, but it doesn't look any radically different, and and that's where I guess I'm going for. Right, and I think I think it's also a good segue <laughs> to you walking us through the different species of um, aloes. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this is a sleeper or or fun, but it's, for me, it's a lot of fun to see the the species and habitat, and I I mean to me that's even better than the hybrid. <laughs> Um, I know that that sounds a little bit sacrilege if you're talking about people that love the hybrids, but if you see the species, you'll get the idea, and that's kind of what I've done. So I've got a, I start with a bunch of pictures of uh, habitat mostly, with a few in, in the garden, but uh, finished with the hybrids that were made from those species. So um, if you want to do that, I'm, I think I'm ready to go. Okay, cool, because we also have uh, questions already. <laughs> And I think he pressed the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> so um, while we're waiting for Kelly to to go back, um, so just uh, I know that I I'm seeing your questions, guys. So Kelly is going to walk us through um, um, the presentation that he has for the species and for the hybrids. So I'm earmarking your questions here on the comment section. And then later on, we are going to discuss it as he go through um, his presentation. And then also later on, we are going to discuss the Philippine setup. So Brixio is going to discuss uh, aloes in the Philippines, how it started here, and some information or literature about that. And then Dan is going to walk us through the basic aloe care. Um, he is now starting into aloes, like what he said. And then Claire, um, and Dan also, is going to walk us through the different um, methods of um, propagation. I know that Claire... Um, it has a lot of, you know, uh, propagations and hybrids. We just have to be careful with that <laughs> right now. <laughs> but um, she is going to walk us through, uh, walk us through that. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, we are going to have the raffle. I'm curious if, uh, if they have collected all the species in the wild or are there still aloe species that are undiscovered? I'd like to ask that to Mr. Kelly Griffin. Correct. So while we're waiting here, so Sir Dan, how's, how's everything there in um, Benguet as of the moment? Well, how about we have a tour while waiting for Mr. Kelly? Yeah. You're going to give us a tour there? 
Uh, just a short one. Wow. <laughs> okay. So, guys, uh, just hang in there. Um, we are uh, waiting for Kelly to join us back. Um, I think uh, we lost his uh, connection, so he is in the process of joining back. So, while we are waiting, um, Dan is just going to give us a tour right at the Living Gifts Nursery. So, take it away, Dan. Yep. yep. Here, here's one of our favorites. It's a fan alo. Uh, uh, it, yep, it's uh, the genus is wow. uh, different now. Uh, we have one potted here, and then we have one planted on the ground. It's branching off really well. Currently, we have four branches on this one. Nice. Yeah. It's about uh, two years all with us. Right? Uh, yes, this one, uh, these two ones. And then we have a aloe spiralis, uh, uh, polyphila pala. Polyphila. <laughs> yep, uh, polyphila. I tried to plant it on the ground, but the core didn't uh, take it well. Maybe it was too hot, mm. so I had to repot it again. And then I thought I thought we lost it already, but then we uh, we saw a pop going out of it. Oh, I think oh, Mr. Kelly's back. Maybe we yeah, can continue. We Kelly back. <laughs> <laughs> so while you were away, Kelly then was uh, giving us a tour of the. Yeah, I, I've got pictures of polyfill in the wild. You'll like seeing them, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> if I ever I really... get there. <laughs> so, Enjoy so looking at those. For some reason, my, my Wi-Fi stopped for a second, and I, I don't know what happened, but I, I don't know what I did, but I'm back. So. Okay, cool. So are you ready with your presentation? I hope so. <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> Let's see if we can do this. Um, Let's bring it on. You see it? Yep, I, I can see it. Um, is it no. there? It is there. This is not an aloe, by the way. <laughs> um, this is kind of the, the, the hard work that you have to go through to make a good aloe hybrid, though. This is at Haworthia McMurtrii site uh, in South Africa. And uh, it, it's a Haworthia habitat, but this was more interesting than the Haworthia to me. Anyway, that's a dung beetle doing his work. <laughs> and, and this is a friend of mine. You can see in the left corner there, that's uh, Walker Young. But this is a, a habitat plants we went to go visit. And this is the, the day before we got there. This is what they'd done to the habitat. So I, I just want to remind people that we, we love these plants in the wild, but we sometimes forget that the wild needs to stay the wild. And, you know, then they end up in... Uh, nursery cans somewhere. But anyway, so this <laughs> aloe is uh, hitting right into the species. This is near Hanke in South Africa. And I hardly ever use this plant because it tends to swamp the cross and give you a really bland, boring, boring leaf. But the flower color is exceptional. Um, and this is aloe tenuar. And this is what it can look like. So you can see why you might want to grow it for flower power and also for the color. It doesn't even look aloe-like in terms of what we typically think for aloes. And then this particular habitat uh, is also in your hanky. We were going to see a gasteria here, uh, Alafie, and we couldn't find the gasteria, but we found an aloe, which is aloe pictifolia, and it's a cute little one. I use it when I'm hybridizing for small size because a full-size pictifolia is about the size of a softball. And it tends to have those upright leaves that you find in hybrids like peppermint and uh, some of the ones that grow with that kind of round ball shape to them. Um, but there it is in, in habitat. Uh, what's interesting about aloes is you have to not have a fear of heights because a lot of them grow on cliffs. And so if you really want to see them in the wild and get close, you do have to tend to go to where they are, and sometimes that's a bit of work. This is a really common aloe. I don't use it much in hybrids. Um, even though it has great flower power, 
Um, the problem is, is that it also tends to bring with it mite uh, vulnerability. Uh, most arborescence hybrids seem to be very uh, uh, encouraging to mites and alamites are an issue. So if you use it in hybrids, oftentimes your hybrids will also be susceptible to it. Um, this is an aloe speciosa field habitat and those clumps with the stemmy looking plants with the pink are uh, what they look like in the wild, beautiful habitat, Aloe speciosa. And that gives you good size. That's Brian Kimball, by the way. He was on the trip with me. Um, this cute little aloe is near um, um, Prince Albert in South Africa. And this is uh, Aloe claviflora. And they make these little fairy rings. So they kind of die in the center and grow outward. And it's a very succulent plant. But the reason you would grow it is this is during one season, you go back and you can see this is in seed. So this was a, we were able to get a few seed. Um, and there you can see it up close. It is very succulent, gray leafed, a uh, few black prickles. Looks almost agave like in some aspects, but look at it in flower. It uh, is a nice wow. small aloe and it brings a lot of uh, flower power to a small plant. So if you can get a claviflora and get it to bloom, it's a great plant to work as a basis for some of the hybrids. See how pretty they are. So this is the same plant I showed you earlier. You're just seeing it in a different season. I say the same species, not the same plant necessarily. I didn't go right to the same plant, but stunning plant nonetheless. Claviflora, called claviflora because the flower is club shaped. It's fatter at the base, at the the mouth of the flower than it is at the base. So it looks like a club. Ooh, Al Alocomptoni is like a kind of a uh, perfoliata kind of complex thing. And it has these really chunky leaves, but Comptoni tends to form these stems that hang down the cliffs. And the rosettes are about a foot and a half across. So it gives you an idea. But here's one that wasn't hanging from a cliff. Mm -hmm. This is Aloe um, and that's Comptonite. Beautiful flower. Mm. So this one I use for, what would you think? Flowers. Yeah. <laughs> and then the real popular one is Striata. This is Striata in habitat. Striata can be quite variable. The most important thing about Striata that it brings to the, the mix is that it doesn't have any spines. And it does have that pink hyaline edge. And you've seen that in a lot of my hybrids because I used it. Sometimes when you cross it with things with lots of teeth, you'll get things that are in between, in between toothiness and not. And this is a special form of striata that we found at Geica Fort. And if you notice, it has almost that rippled edge, but this is a species growing in habitat. So it's not your typical striata, but it's still a striata. And then we were just talking about, Dan was just talking about uh, polyphylla, and this is the little country within the country of uh, South Africa. This is Lesotho, and uh, we took the horseback uh, ride up to go see aloe polyphylla, and this is where it grows. Now, one of the problems that Dan was experiencing with this plant is that um, it tends to give you the idea that it loses the roots, that if you don't water it enough, what it happens is it loses all its roots and it dies. And you're left with the impression that you rotted it because you watered it too much. It's a high altitude plant. It grows at about 7,000 feet. It gets cool temperatures um, with bright, bright light and lots of moisture with very, very good drainage. So I know that sounds like a lot, but generally what happens is people let them dry out and then they water them and they rot and they think they watered them too much. And that's not the case at all. They take a fair amount of water. And they get pretty good sized. Mm -hmm. And here are the flowers. And that is one of, kind of one of my most special um, photos because that's a malachite sunbird and they don't have hummingbirds in South Africa or Lesotho. Sunbirds are what pollinates these things, but it's a malachite sunbird on the flowers of uh, aloe polyphylla in habitat. 
All right, now this is another one I mentioned. This is like Comptonai, but with a little more uh, exaggerated stretched flower and in that same group as um, really Claviflora, but this is a nice looking plant, real pretty thing, Hallow falcata. Uh, falcata, because the leaves kind of are sickle shaped or falcate, um, good bloom power for a little plant. Um, and then this is skittery kloof. This is uh, the uh, aloe camosa. If you look along the top ridge of the pictures, um, you see the, the aloes in profile. This is uh, aloe camosa. And camosa is a, one of those plants that people wouldn't believe it, but that's where a lot of the pinks and uh, lavenders come from in some of the hybrids. Uh, you get aloe camosa to bloom, you cross it with some of the hybrids and that characteristic comes through. So that's where some of the pinks that you see in some of the hybrids comes from. Uh, camosa is a little touchy for some people. It's because they usually water it at the wrong time of year, but it's not that difficult to grow. And here's camosa in bud. And there it is in flower, real pretty flower. Mm. And then one of my all time favorites, this is up in the Maligsburg. This is uh, near jo Johannesburg. This is aloe peglare during the dry season. And peglare during the dry season co coils up like this and just kind of rests. It kind of protects itself with a spiny exterior, but then during the growing season, it opens up and it looks like that. That's what it looks like when it flowers. So a lot of these plants have seasons and we tend to think of people and plants as, you know, just being the, this consistent thing. And if you try to grow a plant consistently one way and it's the wrong way, you will consistently kill it. So one of the things I would always try to think about is like, you don't look the same as you do in the morning as you do late at night after you've, you've uh, had um, a full day. So, Plants have their ups and their downs, and you just need to let them do that and understand that that's part of it. And if you understand that, it can make you a better grower and also make you a better hybridizer. So this is the habitat up near the Richtersveld of uh, Aloe Crapoliana, one of my favorite ones to say. And it's a great plant to use for miniatures because the plant is tiny. That's about the size of a baseball, maybe a little bit bigger than a baseball, but not much and it gets these chunky gray leaves. So this gives you that real reduced size when you're looking for hybrids. And it also has a very nice flower. You hear me? Yes, we are just in awe. <laughs> okay, so, so this would, a lot of people go, oh, that looks kind of like a yellow hybrid uh, striata. And this is actually a species that's closely related to striata, but this one's called Comagasensis, and it grows near a place called Comagas. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a very attractive plant, and it is, like I said, closely related to striata. Uh, it can have orange flowers like these that look very striata-like, mm -hmm. or it can have yellow flowers like these. Yellows are my favorite, but so far I've only gotten one yellow, and I've never been able to pair it up with another one. So. I'm still working on it, but the yellow ones are the prettiest ones to me. Oh, but wow. you can definitely see the uh, the relationship that this would have to striata. Um, it's just a little, little different. The flowers are a little glossier. Uh, it goes removed. Now, this is a, a plant that I love using in hybrids because it's um, microstigma, which means uh, little spots. This particular microstigma has none, and so it illustrates a point. Sometimes we name plants for a characteristic they have, and sometimes that characteristic is absent. It doesn't make them not that species, it just makes them a different form of it. Here's a more typical uh, aloe microstigma. Um, and then this is like frames the eye. So when you're wondering where are those pinks and reds come, and you go, Kelly, you've got all these wonderful colors in your hybrids, there's where the colors are coming from. And this was in habitat, a variegated one. Now, as a hybridizer, and you know, people are you know going, oh, your plants are really wonderful. I look at that and I go, there's not a lot I could do to make that better. That's pretty darn good, and that's in in the hills in South Africa. Right. So, and here, here's microstigma in bloom. It has a nice bicolored flower, so that's another nice thing. It's easy to grow. It's a good plant. Great, great plant to use in hybridizing. Microstigma. And this is frames I've closely related. 
A little different color, more lavender to it. Seeing you, I've showed you three different varieties of it. So when you go up on a hill, you see all different shapes and forms of the same species, and you hopefully capture a little bit about everything. Now, Plicatilis is a really neat species. Uh, it's been recently put into, uh, what is it, uh, Kumara. Uh, I don't know. I still hybridize with it. it. It doesn't readily cross with all other aloes, but I've crossed it with at least four different ones. Um, I'm okay with it being an aloe. It doesn't have to have a new uh, genus name for me to feel any different about it. But here it is in habitat, in flower. And the trick with this plant is that it likes moisture, but it likes good drainage. If you look at the substrate it grows in, it's rock scree, and you almost see no soil. If you look really close, you can't even see the soil. All you see is rocks. And it grows right by a river. So it gets a lot of water in that area. It's a real wet area, but really good drainage. And that's what they want. Um, rock scree, good wa water all the time. There's me getting fr friendly. <laughs> all right. This one is other than, than I love this plant. It's a, a wonderful plant. This is near Kalitstorp in South Africa. This is Longestyla. I love this plant for all that it brings. It's like a, a really toothy humulus. The problem that I have with this being in hybridizing, people will, will know this to be true. Um, Longestyla has some of the biggest flowers and the longest styles and the biggest fruits but it also is a really big mite magnet too. So if you use Longestela, you're breeding with a plant that probably is a little bit like arborescence. It'll bring mites to your, your collection. So, but, but nonetheless, here's Longestela in fruit. And it's a little bit obscene, I know, but those are the seed pods and nothing else. Wow. The seed pods are bigger than the plant itself. Well, they can be pretty, pretty darn big. <laughs> We're not yet sleeping, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> well, this is the diversion. So I found this plant near Springbok in South Africa. And I, I thought, that looks like a spring plant, if any of ever I saw it. And most people would think, oh, well, what is that, albuca? Would you guys guess albuca? Yes. All right. Well, you want to see the flower on it? This is the diversion. Then we'll get right back to aloes. There's the flower. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's a morea. It's, it's, it's not a mm. iridaceae, iris family. It's more than so, an orchid. Yeah, but it's an it's iris, ir, iridaceae. Uh, anyway, uh, I so diversion <laughs> over. <laughs> so one of the plants that I use a lot um, in in hybridizing for flower power is ferox, and ferox is underused in my opinion. It gets big but it sure brings nice flowers to the plant. So I would encourage you, if you're gonna breed for little, use it, but then breed back down to little again and you'll get some nice flowers out of it. This is a really nice red form of aloe ferox. This is a white flower form in habitat. You can see aloe speciosa in the background. Um, and there, there's up close the flowers with a pollinator. And then this is kind of fun because this is also not an aloe, but it follows the next aloe. This aloe, this is a hemanthophony, um, um, hemanthifolia. But the reason I show it is because right after is aloe hemanthifolia. And this is a very wet growing plant and a very, very touchy. A lot of people kill it. If you live in the right place in the world, you can grow this. If you don't, it's really hard to maintain. It wants to be treated a little bit like an orchid in that it likes really pure water. If you see the dripping of the water down the cliff, it's literally drenching wet there all the time. Moss grows. So you think about something that likes good drainage but likes really good pure water and lots of it. That's aloe hemanthifolia. And there it is in seed in the driest of the dry season. You can see the grass is still very green. So this plant just never dries out really. It loves to have good drainage. And anyway, it's a neat plant. Um, I would use it for hybrids because you need to give something back to the vigor because as a species, it's a little bit touchy and hard to keep. Here's up close of the leaves. You can see how it got the name because the leaves do look like Hamanthifolia. Now, I always tell this about to people all the time about allobrumii because a lot of times allobrumii looks awful. And what I wanted to say about that is that in habitat, it looks awful. So <laughs> if, if you grow it this good, 
then you're doing as good as nature's doing. So mm -hmm. don't beat yourself up too much. That said, this is a really terrible form of it and really ugly. And there it is. Isn't that in all its beauty? But here's a different one. This is Broomii Broomii growing in a little area that's a little better water that grows on the termite mound and it, it looks a little better. And then, so this is Broomii Broomii and there it is. And again, that's growing kind of on the side of a termite mound. Nice close wow. up. Very wide leaves. Right. And then this is the form Tarkiensis. So this is a much more luxurious form. It's a much bigger plant. And it's still Broomii, but it's a different variety. Much more luxuriant, gets more water. It's more tolerant of more water, and it looks beautiful. And I threw this in because it's not an owl. This is Crashula astinaciformis. And I, I took a picture of it because it looks so owl-like that it got me to stop yeah. the car. There it is. That's a crassula. And that's about a very unusual crassula. Yes, it is. It's about two feet across. So it's a big one. Wow. It's not a little thing. But the thing is that, like a lot of crassulas, it monocarps out. So when it flowers, you got to collect mm. the seed to start over because it doesn't make babies and it doesn't keep going. So it's one of those things where, you know, in the crassula world, you don't see this a lot in collections for that very reason. I see. Crash last and acephormis. And now this is, the, in the dolomites, this is a aloe that you don't see often, and I probably wouldn't use it in hybridizing because it doesn't bring a lot of um, characteristics that are different to things other than it's an unusual one. This is aloe dolomitica in the Wilkeberg uh, in Limpopo in South Africa. But um, also closely related to aloes is astroloba, Gasterias and uh, astrolobas and even haworthias can be yes. crossed with, with aloes. But in general, you have a lot of uh, fertility problems with these bigenerics. There are some mm -hmm. that help uh, with that. Like if you use polnitsia in the combinations, it, polnitsia is kind of seems to be a, a, a transitory plant between the species. Oftentimes you'll get fertile um offspring. But generally, when you start crossing gasterias with aloes, you got to kind of like what you get because you usually can't go further than that. Mm -hmm. So if you get something that's really cool and you go, oh, if it was only a little bigger or it had more white on the leaves or, you know, it's great. But a lot of times you'll find that they don't make fertile pollen and they don't make good stigmas and they don't set seed. Or if they do, the seed doesn't germinate. Uh, Al Africana is also South Africa. This is uh, near uh, uh, Utenhag, and this is a form that has these wonderful pagoda shaped flowers. So, this would be one you'd use for hybridizing for flowers, flowers possibly. Um, these are uh, Glocka muricata. And I use this one a lot because of the teeth. So you wonder, hey, where did Kelly get the big teeth on his plants? This is the big teeth. I mean, big teeth. And there is a yellow form. This is the form that got described as um, Allocamnelli. I, I don't recognize that species myself because it's only about 10% of the population and it occurs with orange ones right next to it. So. Uh, it's like, okay, well, the yellow flowers are a different species and I don't go for that. Um, this is a form of Glocka, which is closely related to Glocka muricata. This is Glocka spinosior and um, really big plants, but look at the leaves, leaf uh, texture on these things here. Again, you see the bifurcate teeth. You wonder where that habit, where that came from in some of the, the little hybrids that you're breeding with. This is one of the plants that was used. Yeah. And of course, lovely gray pink hues. That's where it comes from. These are the species which you use to, to get those species, to get those uh, traits. Okay. Now, really, can you make that any better? <laughs> 
Uh, aloe vera gata, I don't use very often in hybrids because it, it tends to give progeny that has fertility problems. And this has actually been transferred to goan aloe, which is a different um, genus. But the problem with it is, is that it's still to me an aloe. It just is one of those ones that doesn't want to readily cross with other ones. And oftentimes when it does cross with other aloes, that's about as far as you can go. I show this because this is Burr House, and this is uh, the farm at uh, in New Woodville. And uh, we stayed at this house, but there's the all inspiring, impressive picture of the one plant that I saw in the wild of aloe burii. When I'd gone to this locality earlier, there was hundreds of plants and they've been cleared out and they're in the gardens in South Africa. The farmer is now extremely protective of the one plant he has left, but um, I can tell you he was infuriated that anybody would come looking for him because a lot of people have come there and taken the plants. So this little thing on the, is down near Cape Town in South Africa. And that little rock on the hill looks somewhat arborescence like but it's aloe sucatrina. And I like this plant and I've used it in a few hybrids, but again, it does bring some of those same traits that um, arborescence brings to it in that it tends to be mite uh, infested. So I've, I've mentioned that with arborescence, longestela and sucatrina. Here's the flower on it. And for that alone, the flower's worth it. But um, it, it is something that you have to take into account when you're trying to grow these plants. Now, this is an extremely desolate area near Fraserburg, and this is the habitat of Aloe chlorantha. And it's a very drought-stricken plant and very drought-stricken area. Uh, Euphorbias grow here like Stella spina, but it's a very, very dry in habitat. And it's one of those that only people that want to really collect aloes are going to ever bother to go and ever want to want to grow because it's it looks like hell. I mean, let's face it, that's not a, a beautiful plant <laughs> by any stretch. Here's one that was just in seed. Uh, and again, that's what it looks like in the wild. So that's about as good as it gets. It looks a little nicer in cultivation, but you can see it's a big plant. Now, okay. one plant you will likely grow, and this is south of Springbok in South Africa. This is Melanocantha, and these things are just gorgeous, and they, they grow right on the rocks in little pockets of soil. Um, not difficult to grow, much easier than Iranaceae, as a matter of fact. Uh, growing here with a crashula surrounding it, and love the colors, the rusted colors of it, um, but really a nice, nice plant and easy to grow. This is Melanocantha, which means black spine, and certainly it has that going for it. And this is in habitat. Wow. Wow. And that's that's not an aloe. This is a rock. And that's <laughs> that's what is behind the rock. That again wow. is not an aloe. <laughs> this is in uh, near a port um, uh, uh, Alexander Bay uh, up in the north as we headed into the Richtersfeld uh, to see this plant. And I've heard that recently these plants have really been stricken by the drought and that wow. many, many plants have, have been lost. But this is Allopearsonii in habitat. Makes these wonderful stacked leaved plants. And I've used it in hybrids and it brings that burgundy color to the leaves. It also brings uh, the stacking. It also slows down the growth. So if you want a plant that is very slow growing, that's not a bad one. Allodichotoma, Alloramasystema, Another Alloramasissima. So those are the three three ones. These are the Allodendron now, Allodendron Ramosissimum, but I still call them Alloramasissima. Um, but yeah, there's these are tree aloes. No question. Uh, this is Allo um up in the Richtersfeld, and it grows in this wonderful red brown rock. Beautiful plant. I use this in hybridized because of the intense blue color that it brings. Mm -hmm. um, then all, all time favorite, Allocaris brigensis. This is also up in the Richtersveld uh, near Extin Fontaine. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, again, if I were a hybridizer and trying oh. to breed for that, I would think I finished. And this is a species. So wonderful, wonderful species. This is Aloe Cares Brigensis. And it grows right with Aloe Palenzi. I mean, within a stone's throw. 
there, this was nice to see the young plants. Uh, some, so, so often you see mature plants and no recruitment at all. You don't see any little ones coming along, and that it may, makes you worry. You know, worry about the the future. Yes. But not only were they, these full of seed, but they were full of babies around there. Hello, Palanzi. You travel a lot with Mr. Jeremy Spot. Uh, Jeremy and I travel a lot together. Yeah, um, Brian and Brian and I and Jeremy probably are the the, the guys I travel most with. But here's Ernst von Jarsveld uh, with Alva Kadama. Wow. And that's Walker Young from the Ruth Bancroft Botanical Garden. I like this. Again, it's not an aloe, but if you see that kind of sign, that makes you stop and have pause. Wait, hippos? Really? Here? <laughs> so this is Sean, Sean Hildenhuis, and this is um, aloe angelica. And I got to say, it, it, it's not in flower, so it won't impress you guys, but beautiful flower on this thing. It is bicolored orange and red, and it's really a pretty thing. Aloe angelica. Here it is in full glory in the wild but not in bloom, sorry. And then this is aloe vera to flora. Now I've only had this one, this one bloomed in my yard. I've only had this to work with once and all the progeny have not bloomed yet. So um, I only got it to bloom once for me and that was about four years ago. So it's a plant that it has really green flowers like vera to flora, the name would imply, but it's not an easy plant to grow for me anyway. And it, I welcome other people to tell me how they grow it. It's a very dry growing thing and the flower is well worth it, but it's a lot of work to get there. This one I can say I've done much better with. This is a Madagascar species. This is uh, Exemia. And uh, this, the flowers on this are very glossy. So I use that for hybridizing. And the flower has a short uh, stalk, which is quite beefy, so it holds the flowers well. But it's a big plant. This is a tree aloe and uh, with a leaf span of you know five to six feet across. So it, it's kind of big. And if you do use something like that, it requires you a lot of breeding to breed down to a size that's manageable. But for that flower, you can see why you might not, you might use it for flowers. So I, I didn't really hit Madagascar and I could have done that, but I wanted to dive into the hybrids. And so this is a picture in my, in my garden, wow. I mean, in my nursery. And um, you asked me about what's my favorite. Well, these are probably some of my favorites right now. None of them have names except for one that's mango sherbet that a friend gave me that name. She said that, and then you could tell which one it is. It's the one on the left. But anyway, um, that's kind of where it is. This one just got released. This is purple, purple haze. And this one's in wide release. Uh, you can buy it in Home Depots and Lowe's and uh, in the United States. It's called purple Very haze. Pretty. Yeah. And then this is a Castel Castellon hybrid that I've made. And wow. I'm growing more of that, but I'm already a second, I'm a generation up past this. So um, it gets better. Mm -hmm. And then of course, kind of a creamy yellow and then working with those edges. You can, you can now kind of put it together. Oh, I see what you used. I know how yes. you did that. And that's what's so interesting is when you know where you got the, the genes, you know, it's like, the difference between making a recipe from scratch and making a recipe from a box, you know, and, or going down to the fast food place and then putting it on plates and saying, oh, look what I created. Um, if you know what you used, you then can relate to where that trait came from. And I've showed you kind of just a, a picture of some of the things and you can now see where the colors came from and where the shapes and the leaves and the spines. And you can amplify those. And I'm sure that that'll be the question that's asked. This one is called Aloe Luz, like light. Um, and that one's also in production. Um, it gets those wonderful pink coral edges, but also the new growth comes out with even a lighter pink and then ages to the darker pink. So real pretty thing. And then again, you know, that red color, you're, you're, you're starting to see how it, it all folds together. Um, this is another Castellon hybrid. And then again, that crinkled edge, wow. you can see how it's transferred from the species now to the hybrids. Um, this is one of my Parvola hybrids that 
is way beyond Parvala. And then even, I've been calling these aloes of unusual color because I've started to develop some of the colors that are just weird. And that really mm -hmm. isn't like weird lighting. It's really that kind of gray with a little tinge of uh, mauve and a little bit of yellow into it. That's the way it grows. That's what it does. But where did the color come from? Uh, that frosted came from aloe deferensis. Uh, the teeth came from parvula. And there's a lot of other things in this uh, to get to this point, including um, some help from other friends. So you kind of start to see where when you say, well, your, your hybrids are nice. And what you're seeing in the Philippines are are probably just a little bit behind what um, yep. what we have here, but the production should be only lagging by a couple of years. So hopefully we mm -hmm. can arrange some kind of conduit so that you guys can get these plants too. Yeah, if you want to grow them. Yeah. Um, I'm really fascinated with the textures and a lot of the textures that I, I came about with uh, came from tutelage from uh, none other, other than the great Dick Wright um, and Craig Wright and Dick Wright are friends of mine. And um, mm -hmm. they've been b both inspired me and also um, helped me and vice versa. We're, we're friends as, as has Karen Zimmerman. Uh, I've, I got her started on these things and um, we're good friends as well. Um, so there's a lot of camaraderie that does happen. I, I just wanted to show you some of the things that are in production I, I, this little tip on this on this one where the, the leaf kind of rolls around, that's from a Madagascar species, but I kind of like it. It looks like a dragon's tail kind of thing. And so I'm getting more of that in some of the hybrids, but the colors are in, more intense and um, more varied. So you're speechless, hopefully. <laughs> I, I just have to mention... <laughs> Is there any aloe species uh, in your name that you discovered yourself? No, I, 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 there, I found a few plants and they got described, but I, I've been kind of a big um, proponent uh, of, of naming it for something that makes sense. So we, we found an agave in um, uh, the Presa de Inferno and we named it agave infernoensis because that's where it came from. Um, I'm, I'm more keen on that than having a plant named after me. I could name plants after me, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, that, that just seems so, so ego driven that it just, it's not my nature. I mean, it, it, uh, the other thing is, is I'll, I, I would probably name it after something and then they'd find a better one or something. So then I'd be stuck with that one. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, while, we, while we were on the background earlier, um, Kelly, you mentioned a, a very nice story in terms of how you come about with some names. <laughs> Do you mind sharing? You want me to repeat that story? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so like, like so often, you know, a name... A name can sell a plant that isn't very good, or a name can kill a plant that is wonderfully beautiful. But one of the things we did is we'd, we'd have a, a, a tequila uh, margarita party, and we'd come up with names in a group, and we just catalog all the names and write them down. And towards the end, I have to admit, the list starts looking pretty ridiculous. But <laughs> at least the first drink or two, um, the, the names are pretty creative. People kind of expand their mind. And, you know, we would come up with a list of names. And then when we had a really suitable plant that we really liked, that we really felt strongly deserved to be in cultivation, and we were probably going to go into production on it, then we'd scan the list for the name that seemed most appropriate for it. Um, and I don't want to reveal too many names, but some of these plants that I've showed you have those names. But since I'm showing them to you, and they might be patented, some of them, I don't want to put the name to them so that there isn't a conflict later. So you're kind of getting an early preview of some plants. Most of them won't be patented. Most of them are just my experiments. Um, this is another one of the aloes of unusual color, as I call it. I sometimes write that on the tag, aloes of unusual color. It just seems so <laughs> Twilight Zone-ish. <laughs> But there's just a kind of a kaleidoscope of colors. And that was kind of the name I had for this was kaleidoscope because I just thought it was su such a nice 
um, thing. But you can see how varied you can get with the aloes. The aloes have so many different shapes and so many different colors. And the people in this group that are listening, so maybe some will be inspired and will go, I'm going to do this too. They're going to take it to a different level than I did, and they're going to take it to a different direction than I have. Um, everybody has their own bend on it. And that was what I was saying about art is that it's a way of expressing art through, through nature because you're combining and recombining to your taste and to your desires. So you're, you're creating things that are different, but um, the ones that you're going to work towards and work on aren't going to be the ones necessarily that I would gravitate towards. Um, mm -hmm. There is a commonality. We all like bright colors and generally, and we all like uh, neat textures, and we like variegation, some of us. Um, wow. um, and then, you know, well, you've got Castellone. Can you make it bright yellow? Why not? Sure, you can. <laughs> you just have to take it in that direction. Or you can make it pink. It's funny how I put the yellow ones on top of the red ones, and it's like, the red ones kind of like look like second second fiddle or whatever, and yet a lot of people prefer the red, so it, it is kind of funny. And then I've also made some bigger. This is like about two feet across in the garden. And my my thought was to have a Kelly Griffin aloe the size of a Marlothii with that kind of texture, because the texture that Marlothii has has those really pointed teeth, and the texture that these often have are the real flattened, not piercing teeth. So these are a little more user friendly in terms of garden aspect. And then, you know, white with black, I'm trying to work on that. Yeah. And then you wouldn't think about it, but aloes also can be fragrant flowered. Uh, there are these ones from uh, Yemen, which have these fur like, uh, they're not stinging at all. They're not stinging at all, uh, but they allow the flower, I think, to last longer in intense heat. Uh, because it radiates the temperature mm, yes. and, and also shades it. But this is uh, aloe Lavrano CI, and this is the red flowered form, and then this is the yellow flowered form. But I've been doing more and more hybrids with them to get different colors with that same kind of thing. Like this is a more of a, a true yellow. Mm. And then you mentioned earlier that we, we talked about maybe doing uh, My Other Great Love. This is a new species of agave from Oaxaca that's been recently described by Abasai. We found it before he described it, but he described it before us. So um, this is agave uh, gypticola. It's a relatively new one. And this is what the habitat looks like. And then this is what the plant looks like. Wow. And what you, you'll notice here is it's mostly spineless. In fact, even the tip of the leaves are fairly soft like an attenuata, but it has such nice uh, structure. This one has slightly serrated little teeth, but it has these wonderful almost corrugations like cardboard does to maintain the leaf integrity. And uh, here's one with much less spination, wow. but more blue. You can just see the variations. And, and that was another thing that illustrates it here, not just with agaves, not just with aloes, but with most species. When you go to the wild, you'll see the whole range of different things. And certainly if you wanted to make something new out of this, I might pick the blue one, you might pick the green one. I might pick the spiniest one, you might pick the spineless one. So it's always, it's always everybody goes in a different direction. And I know these aren't aloes, but they could be. Mm. <laughs> What's that, a beetle? Uh, it's another beetle. Pollinators? This was, this was in Oaxaca. And this is the end. That's it. Wow! Th thank you for that stunning that was, show. That was supposed to be twenty minutes. I think I blew it. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, we talked you. talked yesterday, and I said it was going to be at least twice that. So, no, really, okay. really enjoyed it. We we actually want more. But, you know. <laughs> well, I could do Madagascar and show you that because Madagascar, I've made five trips there so far, um, and Madagascar has got a lot of neat plants, but. Even particularly with my focus, which is mostly aloes, um, I could do a couple hours on uh, Madagascar aloes. And that's why I didn't even approach the subject with it, because it just makes it too long uh, in one setting. But yeah, uh, there's so many. There's like 530 species of uh, aloes right now. And uh, probably a full hundred of those are almost worthless to you guys for hybridizing. <laughs> Um, but the other 450 probably have something to bring to the table. And 
I would encourage anybody that's hybridizing to not look past the species, not just go with, you know, one of uh, Karen's and one of Kelly's and just keep putting them together again and again. Because, you know, if you go outside the box, you're going to create something that's outside the box. A lot of Filipino collectors prefer species here. Yeah, I don't, I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm on both sides of the fence. I, I said that the reason I got into aloe hybrids was because I was looking for species and I couldn't go on a trip 24-7. I was only making two or three trips a year, and that leaves a lot of months you're not making trips. So, um, did you leave any aloe species for us to discover? Or oh, there's there's always if you really were on the bend to go discover something new, what you do now is look for a new road. That's what you do. You you go to the country that you have been to before, and you look for a new road that's been built to an area that you couldn't get to before. And that's usually where you find the, the neat new things. Um, uh, it doesn't, it sounds really relatively intuitive, but if you can get to areas that other people haven't gotten to, you're gonna find new species. Occasionally I, I see these people that make their first trip to some country and they discover four new species on their trip and wow. they're always near, near the road. And I'm going, you didn't discover a new species. You're just either <laughs> hyper defining something or you're unaware of what's already out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, generally, you need you need a lot of work to discover new species. But one of the other ways to do is to go down waterways because waterways will get you to areas that you can't get to. But again, that's risky. Get to a waterfall in a, in a boat, it doesn't always go the way you think it's going to go. Any scary moments while collecting? Uh, I've had quite a few scary moments. Uh, most of them have to do with people, but some of them oh. have to do do with um, mm -hmm. other things. Accidents. I, I mean, I, I, you know, sometimes, particularly agaves in Mexico, you're in areas that sometimes they're growing drugs and they would rather not have yes. anybody know that they're growing drugs there. Um, so you really have to be careful. But if you go to a tejito and you ask permission and you show them what you're into and what you're interested in, most people are generally help, help, helpful to encourage you, as they would in most situations. Um, I've had a couple instances in California that were pretty scary uh, with <laughs> rattlesnakes and uh, wasps Ooh. and uh, yellow jackets. So yeah, you, you, you gotta watch yourself. Even when you think you're home and you're safe, you, you gotta watch yourself. But yeah, rattlesnakes, I've gotten close to a couple of times, um, a little closer than I wanted to be. And um, also yellow jackets too close for comfort because they stung the crap out of me. Awesome. So I think this is high time. Um, we do have some questions um, and comments through the comment section of our live. Uh, but our panelists also prepared some questions. So um, I think we can start with uh, Brickshow. Brickshow, if you have any questions for Kelly. Uh, yeah, I was just so amazed. And uh, I just realized that uh, it's a very long way to go in collecting these uh, species. And um, well, for uh, my question is, um, um, since you do selective breeding in the attempt to create new hybrids, um, then based on the desired traits also, so what do you usually do for the other clones which uh, don't pass or merit your standards? Or oh, what do you do with the, the junk? <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta tell you, um, the junk you should throw away. Honestly, because if you sell it as second, Literally. then it, it, oh, this is one of Kelly Griffin's, you know? I mean, right, the problem yes. is it, it muddles your stuff down. Mm -hmm. So I, and that, that's what people, I've had a people approach me before. I bought all these, these uh, plants from you, uh, from your nursery, and they don't have names. Can you name them? And I go, no, I can't. Because if I thought they deserved a name, I would have named them. And so uh, there is that issue. Um, but it, it, it is harder because when you're, especially when you're new to it, you love your children. You know, you, you raise them and you go, wow, this is the most beautiful plant. But if you find yourself naming five plants out of a batch of seed, you're probably overdoing it. Uh, I feel lucky if I grow a good sized batch of seed and I get one plant that I can work with, not that I'm necessarily done with it, but that I go, that one's got promise. And I think I, if I, got it a little bigger or a little toothier, or a little better color, um, that it might be worthwhile. 
And yet it's hard because, you know, some people are doing it on a, you know, a backyard scale and the, the, they have what they have. And so uh, yeah. if I could say anything, just try to be fully aware of what's already out there and also try to be fully aware whether you really have something that's radically different than what's already out there. All right. <laughs> so, somebody wrote Kelly's junk is my top shelf. <laughs> I got that. I'm, I'm, I'm liking to see that. Um, the, the, the problem with that is, like I said, is you do run out of space eventually. And, you know, it's like anything. Mm -hmm. If you if you collect the gu the garbage, then you got to deal with it. And I, I like if, if, if I look through my collection and there's any reason to get rid of a plant, I will seize that reason. If it if it's um, um, if it's got like a tendency to get black spot out it goes. If it, if it starts to get mite before anything else does, out it goes. If it, if it gets the dead leaf tips, out it goes. If it splits on the leaves, out it goes. Because those are traits that are hard to get rid of once you start breeding with them. And um, mm -hmm. so if you just constantly refine that, I, I think it makes for better breeding. Um, but somebody else asked me, you know, like, what do you go for? I, I think I go in like 50 different directions. I'm, I'm severely ADD. And I, I can just tell you that that you know gray gray really appeals to me for aloes, but the marketing department goes, "What are you making gray aloes for?" <laughs> so I, I I have this thing where I want to do what I want to do, but at the same token, I, I I have a job and they they pay me to do it. So I have to listen to what the inputs are, and if they say they want something with more flowers, I make something with more flowers, and so there you go. Maybe yeah. one for you and two for them. <laughs> yeah, when I was very young, I worked at uh, Saddleback Junior College and um, I was the greenhouse lab technician. And one day I got a call from Myron Kimnack, which you may or may not know, but he was the director and also the journal, Cactus and Second Journal editor. But I got a call from him and he said that I could come up to the Huntington and get cuttings for Saddleback's collection. And my boss at the time was uh, Zane Johnson, and he gave me permission to get the van and, and go up to Huntington on a Monday when they were closed and collect. Well, I can tell you, I went one for Kelly, two for the greenhouse, one for Kelly, two for the greenhouse. <laughs> yeah. so I, at that time, I got to say, I was taking cuttings, and I was responsible for getting them rooted and getting them growing. So that was a good start for me. But I think that that's why you see such nice plants coming out of uh, Huntington from the ISI, because... Karen has access to these wonderful plants. And it, so if you're going to do it too, give yourself a lot of paint to paint with. If you, the more paints mm. you have, and I, by, by paints, I mean flowering plants. Oh, look at that. There's a cattail. <laughs> um, the more paints you have, the better picture you can paint. And, and it's really true. And the other thing is you need to look at how you can do that. You, you shouldn't be afraid to dry out some of the pollen and freeze it. If you freeze pollen, it gives you the ability to cross plants that you otherwise couldn't do. Uh, oh. Also, it also gives you the option to make more of a species. I've had like an aloe pearson eye bloom right now, but my two other clones said not this year. And so I take the pollen and I freeze it, and then next year, sure, sure, Begora, the the other one blooms, and I take the pollen out of the freezer and I make more of the species. So freezing, freezing seed, uh, freezing pollen is a really great way to go, uh, both for hybridizing and for making more of a species. But you need mm. to keep track of the different clones so you don't cross the same clone with the same clone because generally, not all people would know this, but most owls are incompatible. There are several owls that will take their own pollen, but most of them need a separate, distinct clone. I've had a lot of people divide their aloe parvula into two and say, well, it's set seed and therefore it's you know, two different clones, but Parvel is one of those ones that does set, it's, take its own pollen often. And uh, also it's not as persnickety about taking its own pollen, uh, but you definitely need two separate clones. And that means two individual plants, not just two different heads of the same plant. I just posted it, uh, dumpster diving at Kelly's anyone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, they get put through a shredder. I'm sorry. They get put through a shredder. And then they go into a compost pile. Oh, oh, we, we would have people going through our garbage all the time. And, and sometimes, we, exactly what I said, I throw them away because they have a tendency to get disease or 
to get insects and I don't want them out there. So okay. if I see something with disease or insects, it goes in the garbage sometimes. And the, that unless it's something really special, like a species I, I um, have to have and have to maintain, then I don't really go through the trouble of exposing myself to lots of noxious chemicals. I just be a better <laughs> propagator. <laughs> Yeah, so don't, don't don't get creeped out if you see someone, you know, like looking around your dumpster. <laughs> you know, it's really hard. They never they would ever, never find it because we have so many properties. They never really find the dumpster, I'm sure of it. <laughs> Al Almas is like is like the little Pac-Man of, of nurseries. We've got so many different properties and my plants are all over the place, but only in certain places and usually behind locked fences, so Till they come out in the in the trucks and head to the the grocery stores and to the the other nurseries that buy them. Right, and then we we have a question here uh, from our audience, um, Kelly. Do you store pollen in the freezer? Do you use any desiccant? Yeah, uh, you, you want to dry it out. I don't necessarily have to use a, a desiccant. A desiccant will make it last longer. Um, but if you dry it a little bit, like maybe for three or four days uh, after it's dehesed in a, a vial and seal the vial and freeze it, it'll last for two or three years um, mm -hmm. with pretty good viability. Um, if you want to go to more trouble and you use some desiccant with it, um, that helps preserve it even better because the only real only real enemy is um, moisture, and, moisture and and being too warm. They're not being cold enough. Mm -hmm. So so those are the things. But I put them in little tiny vials, and the reason I do is because I can pull out just a little vial to use it when I want to cross it. You don't want to mm -hmm. like put a big vial of, of yes. pollen together because then you're thawing it out and bringing it out. And so the little vials work really good, and and you can get those at most. Uh, you know, um, laboratory supply places. They mm -hmm. sell these little tiny vials that, you know, can be used for storage of seed too. I think seed banks use them as well. Yeah. We used to use use those at our gene bank. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you were young, did you did you think oh, of this as a... When, when I was young? Uh, when you were young, did you think <laughs> this would be a career for you? Age here. <laughs> no talking of age, you're done. <laughs> I'm still young. <laughs> I've been a child my entire life, and I will be a child till I die. Um, you know, I had a really cool father. My dad worked for United Airlines and was in on the ground floor at United. He started in United Airlines in 1941. And... Um, he traveled with me and took me all kinds of places and opened my eyes to the world. And one of the things he said, and this is an old saying that everybody's heard before, but find something you love and something you're passionate about and you'll never work a day in your life. And mm -hmm. all I can say is just follow your passion. If you have a passion for it, do it. Because the people that don't have a passion for it, they just come in and punch the clock. They don't really care what they, they come up with. I, I still am crossing plants at 12 o'clock at night because I want to create something new and see what happens. And so I would just say, if you have a passion for it, follow your passion. Nice. And then we, we have a question just in, I think it's related to the previous one. So do you shake off the pollen or do you just stick a whole flower in a bio? That's a good question, Chuck. Um, what, you, what I do generally is I wait till the flower opens. And the moment it opens, the moment it opens, you have to be cautious because bees will come and steal your pollen from you. The other thing that happens is you get these little um, tiny uh, thrips and mites that will eat the pollen as well. So sometimes it's better to take the flower right before it's gonna open. But as soon as you expose the flower to um, the air, it starts to hesing, that starts that process. So what I usually do is early in the morning, go out and get the flowers that I wanna freeze the pollen on, bring them in, let them open a little bit, peel back or cut back the perianth, and then pop the anthers off and then put them in a little vial and leave it open long enough till I can see that the pollen has dehesed into like powder. Sometimes it takes two days, sometimes three, but not longer than that. And then cap it and freeze it. So th the other thing is we said that moisture was your, your enemy. The more parts of the flower you have in there that have moisture in it, 
the less long that the flower is going to last. So, um, and also the moisture within the context of the perianth can bleed into the pollen and make it wet and unusable. So you want to keep it dry and you don't want any of the flower parts in the vial, just the anthers. Killed right. it. I answered it. Knocked it out. <laughs> Yeah, very extensive one. And Somebody it, asked me out earlier what, what are my favorite tools or whatever. I use a pair of sharp, very small clippers, and I cut the pairing on uh, I highly recommend it because somebody else also asked me a question yesterday from this group, the, one of these people that's right here. And yeah, yeah, it's clear. I think you have you have a question for Kelly. Um, yeah, <laughs> regarding <laughs> Sorry. How do you I have was keep other insects regarding away from the, the pollination or the pollen. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. Yeah, with, with regards to with probably thousands of aloe, how do you keep track on oh, yeah, yeah. How, yes, with, with yeah. You probably have thousands of aloes in your uh greenhouse and um I was wondering how do you keep track of it uh when you're using I mean what pollen you use? For the certain for certain plants, well, like uh, for okay. example. Okay, go ahead. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> that question. Um, how do I keep track of it? Well, here's the thing. I'm always very structured in terms of thinking about what I'm trying to create. So I'm not going to go. Okay, well, this olive flower and this olive flower, and I'm going to put these two together and mm -hmm. write it down, because that's not going to do me much good. What I do oftentimes is I'll have favorite plants that are my go-to plants. I also record whether the plant makes bad pollen or whether it doesn't make a pod. I mean, oftentimes you have these plants and you go, oh, this is so cool. And you cross them and no seeds formed. And you cross them and no seeds formed. It doesn't mean that it will never cross. It could mean it's a tetraploid. It could mean that it's just being really fussy. But that one doesn't get, is not one of my go-to plants. If, it, if, it, if it's not something I can work with, then it's, it's not a good plant. But then if I have two named plants I'm crossing, like viper crossing with castellone, I would write on the viper in a tag the color I did the thing. And I often use dental floss to mark the flowers that I did. But what I'll often do is do the entire group of flowers with that one cross so that I don't have to try to keep track of five different ones from that plant. And I have enough plants that I can do that. But, but that said, it only becomes relevant if I cross X with Z and it turns out to be a really great Grex and I wanna repeat that one. Because there's so many combinations and recombinations that a lot of them, they just don't make the cut. So if, if you were to the point where you were like, Pretoriensis crossed with Humulus, crossed with uh, Pearsonii, crossed with Marlothii, crossed back with um, uh, Humulus longestila. That doesn't tell you a lot because the randomness of all those crosses gives you a plant that's so random that repeating it wouldn't give you the same thing. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm more interested in is if, if I can cross my Viper with my Castellone and I get really something good, I keep track of that. But if it's better than both of the parents, I've got something. If it's better than neither of the parents, it's going into the shutter. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. How about um, if, if for example, I want to I want to pollinate um, plants that are planted outside? Um, how do you keep track of it when uh, with all the external pollinators like the bees and the birds? Well, I, I, I know you can see that in the background, I do a lot of agaves. And generally, agaves are hard to pollinate in a greenhouse because they don't usually flower very well in a greenhouse. They usually need to yeah. be in So what I do with, with agaves is the same thing I do with, with aloes. Um, I'll prepare the flowers by cutting off all the pollen of that flower of the stigma I'm going to use. And I'll oftentimes trim back the perianth. If you trim away the perianth, then the hummingbirds and the other pollinators don't see anything but a mutated flower and they don't usually flock to that one. So then I cross it with the pollen that I intend to put on there. And with agaves and with aloes, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the stigma is often ripened at a different time than the pollen ripens. The pollen usually ripens first and the stigma ripens afterwards. 
So generally, if you destroy the flower shape that draws the hummingbird in, and you remove the pollen from the flower that you intend to pollinate, um, then you'll get the cost that you intended. Also, as an indicator, I'll strip away the flowers before that I didn't cross and the flowers above it that I, that I don't intend to cross so that only the flowers that develop are the ones that I, I made the cross on. And then I record that on a label and stick it next to the plant. And when I collect the seed, I'll put that label onto the plant seed. But, but there's a lot of ways to, to get around it. You're fighting bees. Bees take our pollen stealer, and they're, they're, they're just doing their job. They're just having a good time. Hummingbirds do the same thing. They'll go to every flower in your entire collection. So another thing you can do is isolate those plants that you really want to pollinate. And then you can do that in a, either a, a small chamber in a greenhouse by putting a screen all around it, or you can even bring the plants indoors for the period of time that you're pollinating them and then move them back out to the shade structure after you've done the pollination. So there's all kinds of ways to circumvent the pollinators you don't want. Long answer. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that, Ms. Blair. I hope that answers. I know you are you know, such a pro already in terms of pollination, so I think that's a good one. A pair of sharp clippers can really change the, the attractiveness of a flower. You cut away the perianth and the color away from the flower, and most pollinators aren't interested. Oh, okay. And then we just have a question here while my dog is going mad. <laughs> Your dog has a question? <laughs> what aloe species or hybrid do you often use for hybridizing? I think you've mentioned a few of that um, on your slide earlier. But uh, if, if you have a favorite, go I do definitely have favorite go to plants. There's no question. Um, I know that in the coming days and the future, I, I knew this going into it, uh, Alo Castellone would be getting more and more uh, into hybridizing because it flowers continually. It, it seems to flower two or three times a year. Uh, it's easy to grow. It's not terribly large. Uh, it brings a full size flower. I mean, there's a lot of things that it brings to the equation. But knowing that, I've been doing Castellone hybrids since I got the seed in 2007. Most people are doing it since they got one of the tea seed plants in the last three or four or five years. So I think I've kind of gotten a little bit of a jump on the Castellone hybrids. But uh, if you're just crossing your Castellone with one other plant in your garden, don't get too excited about it yet and, and throw a name on it because uh, there's probably some other things out there that, that probably are going to, I wouldn't try to discourage you on that, but I just think and be aware of what's out there. Um, and on the, on the flip side of that, it's a great plant to use for hybridizing. It's easy. It, it makes the plants that you grow with it easy. And uh, it's nice. But uh, parvula is another one because parvula brings a lot of texture to the leaf. Uh, it's little and has a nice flower. Parvula, uh, Aloe parvula has a really nice flower, that kind of bell-shaped uh, pink and white, reddish white flower that, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's a nice little flower for a little plant. So those are two that I would go to. But you know, having hybridized probably hundreds and hundreds of named ones and probably thousands of unnamed ones, um, I always have something to work with. I mean, if I could show the garden, it would be kind of ridiculous. You'd see how, maybe I can do that. Can I do that? Oh, sure. Oh, <laughs> we're, we're on the exciting. move. <laughs> on the move. That's exciting. Good well, thing it's still very bright there. Yeah, it's, it's still daylight here. So this is this is, this will kind of give you an idea here. I think that's the bench of what's flat. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, this is hard to do with this. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see if I can do this. How's that? So that's the bench I'm working with right now. You can see a lot wow. of areas and aloes. Wow. And it doesn't end there. We'll get there. <laughs> I don't want to stand it too long. Uh, ooh, we're getting dizzy here. There we go. <laughs> anyway, um, so some of them are pretty cool, and you can see a lot of them are pregnant. Different sized shapes and flowers. And then it continues over here, and that's the garden. Ooh. Wow. wow. So we, we can do the next one. And you part see the ladder the in place? That's like... <laughs> um, 
So there might be a few hybrids here. Wow. And that you have few. Agave, <laughs> had, had to get to the top of the agave. Okay. So that was the that was the five minute or the five second. Uh, um, <laughs> that was such a tease, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> Hey, you, you, I don't know this. I don't know all you people. <laughs> it's like they're throwing us a picture of an ice cream. One of you guys said you were stalking me, so. <laughs> all right. So anyway, I, what I was going to say is there's there's lots of work to do. And, and you know, the thing about it, everybody can do it. And, and everybody can do it and put their own spin on it. And uh, it's nothing... Like I said, I, we were joking earlier about anybody can put pollen on a stigma. Yes, that's true. And some can do it at a really high level and some can do it at a really in-depth level. And some people can come up with similar results with at a, a very backyard garage level. You know, So there's, there's no if, ands, and buts. If you're really passionate about it, you can take it to whatever level you want to take it to. Uh, and again, the thing is your babies, you're going to love them. You know, it's like how I made them. You know, they're my babies. But do look critically on that when you're naming them. Yeah. Well, a lot are really hunting on your uh, dumpster, but we have a new, we have another question here. So, is it true that the first flowering of an aloe won't de develop into seed pods if you pollinate it? No. It's, well, I, the first blooming is sometimes immature and sometimes the plant doesn't have the ability to support it. But I, I don't find that true at all because I, I just showed you some with pods on them and it's the first time they bloom. So that, that can't possibly be true. Um, okay, gotcha. And I think, I think this one um, is interesting because like what you've mentioned with regards to not being sure what the result of the pollination is going to be. So to propagate your your best plant out of a thousand seeds, do you propagate through tissue culture? Yeah, um, when I, my first job was at Rancho uh, Soledad Nursery and we, we had a tissue culture lab in, in house there. Um, shortly after I moved from there, I opened up Zurich Growers with uh, Alan Rapashi and we tissue cultured stuff there. Um, I currently have a lab in my backyard, um, but the lab that we have at Altman's is way, way better. It's, it's, it's huge with hundreds of hoods. I mean, it seems like I should say hundreds, more like tens of hoods, but a lot of people working to make new plants uh, of varying varieties. We even make, you know, uh, Venus fly traps and all these uh, kangaroo paws that people, people like so much. Um, but a lot of my aloes as well. And yeah, I definitely use TC because generally, uh, as much as people say bad stuff about TC, it's usually coming from people that don't quite understand TC. And I try yes. to tell people that tissue culture is like a pair of pruning shears. It, it's a yes. tool that yes. you can use to make more plants. And uh, if you use it right, it can make a lot of nice plants. And if you use it wrong, you can screw it up and not get what you want. It's like a Xerox copy that went bad. So um, if you get it contaminated, if you get you know viral infections, uh, you can have a crappy plant, and that can happen. But generally, most of the labs that you're getting in a commercial, they are screening for that constantly. So the plants are generally pretty good. And occasionally we get uh, a, a mutation that's really a, quite nice. Things like uh, snow glow and some of the irrigated agaves that that is a repl replicable uh, mutation that, that takes place. And if we can make more of those and people like it, it's a win-win. Um, but yes, uh, tissue culture is a, a good tool for propagation methods, particularly when you come up with one really good plant. Because if you take one aloe and it's really nice and you core it and it makes three pups, uh, six months goes by and you core those three and you, you um, get three more by the end of a year and a half you have like nine plants and with tissue culture in about two years you can have a thousand so if, if you're trying to get a plant to market so that people can buy it and enjoy it yeah it's the way to go but you really have to think long and hard about it. is this one going to make the cut because you can't just guess that the plant's going to be okay and it's going to do well it can look really cool in a pot when it's you know eight months old but then you grow it for a year or two and you realize it's a dog and it's got some problems. So 
a lot of the plants have to be grown for a while. I mean, you look how lasting uh, something like Delta Lights has been. It's because it's a good grower. It's decent. It's interesting shape. It's not hard to grow, and it's been around for almost 20 years. <laughs> right. Okay. And then, Hello. Uh, yeah. Earlier, you mentioned about um, cross compatibility. Mm -hmm. So, um, how are you able to determine that just just by experiment? I guess. Which one is compatible with which, or can you see that based on the features of the plant? Whether a plant will be able going to be cross? compatible. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's been mostly trial and error. I mean, like I, I made a little uh, gaster aloe called Twilight Zone, and it's generally infertile, but it, it, it does set seed and occasionally makes babies. So to say that it can't be crossed isn't true, but to say that it is, has fertility problems is absolutely true. Um, so if you, if you have an issue with um, most of what my experience has been trying it, and failing, and that tells you something. Um, but trying and failing doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means you weren't able to do it yet. Uh, you know, we even have the c capacity now to do gene splicing. And I wouldn't recommend gene splicing for a lot of things, but when you're growing plants for the aesthetic beauty, if you can come up with something that's, a, that's pretty, it's, it's, it's a, a no-brainer, you know, why not? I mean, you're just gonna look at it and it either looks pleasing to you or it doesn't. Uh, I, I might be a little more critical of something like that if we were talking about a food crop or something like that because mm -hmm. I don't know enough. And that's the big problem is we tend to make decisions on things we don't know about. But certainly um, I've had my eyes bug out when I saw a really beautiful plant. If, if I could make it more beautiful by using a mutagen or, or by uh, causing you know, variegation in it or uh, manipulating that, then surely why wouldn't I? Um, because all we're looking at is, does it look pretty? Gotcha. Okay, and uh, Brittia, I think you have another question. Uh, yeah, since we're already talking a bit on the propagation uh, part, um, I just want to ask a question, and this is actually one of the uh, highly debated uh, question uh, among collectors and uh, you know, breeders. Um, can you actually propagate aloes through uh, leaf propagation? Uh, it's doable, but it's more of an oddity than it is in a, um, a dependable thing. Uh, okay. The reason I say that is because I've absolutely done it. I've, I had a, a, a hybrid aloe yeah. that I crossed, uh, I think it was Cryptopoda with aloe falcata. And to this day, I still have the plant, and I have four of them now, and they were all grown from leaf cuttings. But basically, mm -hmm. pull the leaf off, and it's, it's more like almost like a gasteria leaf. Generally, aloes have a very fleshy base to the leaf or a very thin base to the leaf, and it usually rots before it roots. But it can be done. And certainly, uh, the way to find that out more succinctly would be to do it in tissue where you don't have to worry about the rot because yes. you're sterile. Mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes, when we TC a plant, we can TC floral parts or root, root nodes. So, you know, you can use other meristematic tissue to re mm -hmm. replicate a plant. And uh, that's certainly done. Um, I, I would say that leaf propagation by aloes is not very reliable. It's not very efficient. Uh, and I wouldn't invest too, too much energy in it other than if you're trying to impress somebody for your college uh, um, <laughs> science project. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. Uh, we are very innovative here in the Philippines. So we're trying different things out. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you have a meristem, you could just tissue culture it. So why would you do leaf? I mean, and if you really read enough about meristematic tissue and how to work with it, you can do it in a, an aquarium in your garage, I mean, or in your, your kitchen. So, I mean, it's possible to do. If you're going to go to the trouble to try to get leaf cuttings, I would say get a book on how to make plants and test tubes and study up on it and fart around with it and see what you come up with. Cause it's not that hard. It, it's a lot of jumping through hoops and it certainly is a lot easier when you do it the right way. And you've had some experience. It's easy for me to say it's harder for you because you've never been there, but um, it really isn't. It's just taking steps like climbing a ladder and you get to the top, you're there. Right. And Sir Dan, I think you have a question. 
<laughs> Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> what about Claire? Mom Claire, do you have any other question? Um, any other question? Oh, I don't. Uh, I think that that has been asked already regarding the tools <laughs> and. Oh, okay. I have one. Yep, breaks you. Go ahead. No, it's your done. Oh yeah. Oh, that's sure. Sir Dan, go ahead. Uh, do you have a book out there yet, or are you planning on writing one? Do I have a book out? No. And I'm going to wait to retire. I can't travel anymore. I'll stay home and write books and <laughs> play lots of Bruce Springsteen singing about glory. Day. <laughs> Remember, he's still young. So it's um, not. I, I, I can say that I've contributed to a lot of books. I've written, um, I mean, I've contributed to uh, the CSSA Journal. I'm a director at the, on the CSSA, the Cactus and Silicon Society of America. And um, I've contributed journal articles um, in the definitive Allo book, which was written by uh, Lavranos, who's now passed, but he was a good friend, a great man. Um, the pictures of Allo and Gratensis were from my trip because he told me I should go get that one and go get pictures of it, and I did. And so he knew that I had them. And so when he wrote the book, he asked me for the pictures, and I said, yes, of course. So I've contributed to some significant um, periodicals on aloes and uh, also Jeff Moore's book, who's a good friend, lives in Solana Beach. Uh, he's done some books on soft succulents and spiny succulents, and uh, I've given him photos, and we're good friends and been on a few trips together. So. Um, I just contribute when I can, and I, at some point when I do retire, um, I think I'll have more time to write. And I think I, at last count, I had 175,000 photos of plants in my <laughs> library. So it's really hard. People ask you, "Do you have a photo of that?" I go, "Yes, I do." But where is that photo? And I have to go back in my because it's not very well filed. I have to go back to when I actually saw it, and if I can find the date on the calendar, I can go back to the date I took the photo, and it's. It's always the way to find it by date. So I have to remember what country it was and which trip that was on, and I can get right to it. But uh, in fact, Brian asked me today for uh, Cyphostemma pictures. So, right, it could probably go into a movie, just a slideshow of all of your pictures. <laughs> it, 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 well, no, it's funny when I, when I was first when I first met my wife. Um, I said, do you want to look at my plant pictures? And she goes, not if it would take a couple hours. And I go, oh, it would take way more than a couple hours. <laughs> and so she says, well, oh, I didn't mean to say that because, you know, it's like we were just dating. And we were like, talk about hurt feelings. It's like, do you want to look at my etchings? You know, and, and I'm like, no, um, not really because it will take too long. So the, the, then she let, asked later if she could look at my plant pictures. And I said, no, because it'll take too long. <laughs> uh, that's a good question from Adrian about uh, what yeah. uh, aloe hybrid uh, you think is susceptible to pest viruses. Um, I mentioned using some plants that I don't use because of that very reason. Uh, arborescent, beautiful flat plant, very common. Everybody has it. It has yellow flowers, red flowers, pink flowers, um, but it always brings that juicy aspect to it that just aloe might seem to love. Longestela also is very mite prone for me. Um, some of the Madagascar ones, most notably, probably things like uh, conifera tends to get mite. But if you know that, you can cross it with things that almost never get mite, and you'll get hybrids that can either get mite or not. And so there, there is actually that aspect. Um, certain um, aloes, uh, particularly Brumii and Angelica get uh, the black spot a lot on their leaves in uh, high humidity. Uh, so you got to get the air movement right or you're going to have fungal problems. So yeah, there are plants that do it and it, it, it'd be almost like a list by list of plants that have their upside and their downside. But that's one of the beauties of making a hybrid is that you can breed for the qualities you want and ditch the ones you don't. And uh, if you just, like, you know, you get the Grex and you can see the five under your conditions that aren't growing very well, those you don't g move on with. You move them out of your collection and you move them into the waste pile. So, 
Absolutely. There's with a hundred with five hundred and thirty odd species, there's some that are very prone to not being too happy outside of their native habitat. And that's one of the things often you read about allopolyphila is that you can't grow it outside your its native habitat, which is an absolutely untrue statement. You can absolutely grow polyphila into a beautiful plant. You just have to make sure that you give it the characteristics that, that it needs to grow properly. And that means bright light, cool temperatures, a lot of good clean moisture, and good drainage. And if you can give it all those things, you can grow it fine. But if you live in an inland desert area and you get 110 degree heat, you're not going to grow aloe polyphyll unless you do it in the shade and you've got like a moisture pad in front of it with blowing air across it. You're not going to do it. It's just not going to be happy. It's an alpine plant. So there are plants that, that have that. But on the flip side, I thought, oh, well, I have allotomatosa, which has fuzzy flowers, and it's a bulletproof plant, easy to grow. How about if I cross common coast with polyphyla? And I did it. And then there's one in my backyard. I panned over it, but you didn't see it. Um, anyway, to make a long story short, you can do that. You can take a plant that you like and say, okay, well, I can't grow this one. But if I hybridize it with something, maybe I can. And I think eventually you could follow that road back and get to a plant that looks like an aloe polyphyla that grows like an aloe brevifolia. And that's, that would be something really good. I, I mean, we don't need to necessarily grow the species if we can't. I mean, it's fun to grow the species. It's great to grow the species. But if they make you backflips in order to keep them alive in your collection, and every time you go on a two-week vacation, you lose them, then they're not really that fun to grow. So they're right. out. So so I, just, I, I feel for you, Dan, because I did had trouble with the polyphyla. I'm telling you, it's not because you didn't you watered it too much. It's probably because you didn't water it and it lost its roots. The, the, if, you, if you ever pull up a polyphyla and look at it, the roots are really tiny compared for Alice. You know, Alice sometimes have these roots that almost look like fingers coming out of them. They're so big. But Alice polyphyla has little roots. And what happens is if you let them go dry for too long, they de dehesce down to almost nothing. They're, they're just like nothing. And then when you water it, they instantly rot. They don't, they don't re-root or re-inflate re with water. And so that rot travels up to the crown, and the crown rots out, and you lose the plant. And then you, you're left with the impression that I rotted it out, so I must have watered it too much. So it's kind of like the antithesis of what, what people do. The next time, they water it even less and kill it even quicker. So all I can tell you is think of it as an alpine and think about plants that are alpine and people like that live in Melbourne, they can grow it great. People that live in the Bay Area can grow it super fantastic because it's cool. Uh, they can give it full sun by the coast and it gets the moisture that it loves and that's ideal for it. That's what it wants. Right. I so, have a question. Uh, about, go ahead. Uh, about uh, the indoor trend. Because a lot of people how people now are collecting plants indoors is it possible that uh, eventually we'll have an uh, a aloe that tolerates uh, heavy shade indoors with low yeah, light I mean, conditions uh, i'm growing a lot of gasterias and hybridizing with gasterias i've been working on a gasteria project for about 5 years now and gasterias take a lot less light the big problem with plants that take less light generally though is they have crappy color. They look like green nothing. And so you have to either come up with some really interesting shapes that are really dynamic, or you have to get a plant that colors up under really low light. And both of those things are not easy to do. So it is possible. Um, when people ask me about succulent plants that take low lights, I say, well, this is really easy. Use plants that are understory plants. Um, for example, uh, Alice sepulta tends to grow in, in bushes, and that's why it has this long spindly flower. So it takes fairly low light. Um, it doesn't color up as good as it could, but it's one that will take low light. Uh, Sansevierias tend to be bulletproof because mm -hmm. oftentimes they grow in nature inside of a bush, another plant. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're used to getting crap light. But uh, unfortunately for most of these plants that we talk about getting low light, they tend to be big green nothings, and that's not mm. very exciting. You know, who wants yes. a shelf full of greenness? Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe if you, you know, if, if you're going to do that, you could just sow grass seed and 
have mm-hmm. a lawn in the <laughs> windowsill. But a lot of the aloes I've been working on, um, particularly the white ones and some of the um, ones with neat flangy teeth, they can take lower light and they seem to do okay with it. They just don't color up quite as nice as I'd like them. And I, I think that there's potential. I think you could probably, with breeding, breed plants that color up easily or easier under lower light. Mm-hmm. So it's possible. <laughs> You're on mute, Jello. He thinks he's Sorry. talking. I muted myself. <laughs> so you you were talking about pest prone aloes earlier. So are are you a fan of pesticide or are there any home remedies that you can recommend? I love pesticides. <laughs> no, I, I mean I, you know, you think about gardening, how nice gardening would be if you didn't have pests and you didn't have weeds. I mean, yes. gardening would just be love all day long. It would, it would be no, no problems. Um, I have problems with, um, somebody's asking me to show my pink gasteria. You can look for that online, Michael. That's there. Um, um, in, t- in terms of uh, um, pesticides, I'm not afraid to use them, but I try to not go nuclear um, until it's really necessary. And I would, I, I, when I was very young, I worked at Nurseryland, which is a local garden center. And people would come in with their roses and they had bought these little eight ninety nine dollars roses and they were really terrible shape roses. And they'd, they'd grow them and they'd, they'd, they'd sit, bring me pictures and they'd say, oh, it's all got little fungus all over it and it's terrible and <laughs> what can I do? And I said, well, you can spend $30 on, on pesticides to expose yourself to and fungicides, or you could just get another nice rose for $14.99 instead of $8.99. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that a lot of times you nurse these things forever to try to get them back once they've taken a turn for the cell. The thing is, if it's something that's rare and you can't get it, it's probably worthwhile. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. there are things that I will go to that effort to try to save and, and get going again. Um, but generally, I try to do the, the least toxic. So if it's a little sucking insect like an aphid or a mealybug, I usually use uh, isopropyl with soap. Um, and I, again, this is just for me. This is not me telling you to do this. Um, but that's what I how I handle it. Um, if I have a urifid or a mite problem, I often use um, a product containing something like horrible, um that can be seven or something like that. But but you have to be very cautious when you're using pesticides because they not only kill pests, they kill people and they kill animals. So uh, that's an issue. I, we have a terrible problem with snails and slugs here, particularly with other gardeners around us that don't do anything to their snails or slugs but feed them. And... Uh, <laughs> So there are the, all these issues you have to deal with as a gardener. And I, I think that there's remedies, but there's probably no good solution. You know, bugs are with us to stay kind of like uh, the COVID, I'm afraid. Yeah. So they were asking, um, do you have, uh, there's a lot of questions like this, actually. So <laughs> do you have a space where people can buy yeah. plants right from big box? Yes, um, if you live in California, or you have relatives that live in California, or you have friends that live in San Diego, um, you have a retail outlet of uh, almond plants called Oasis, that's Escondido, California. And um, if you Google it, they they do ship online, I think within the continental US. um, And they don't always have all the varieties because sometimes we have exclusive deals with, with Lowe's and with Home Depot. And so that they get the the, the plants before anybody else, but um, eventually the idea is that you, you should be able to get them from us as well too and have a good selection. Um, the other thing is, is if you have anybody that lives in this area, they can certainly go over there and get them for you and send them to you because then you, um, if you live in you know the Midwest or you live in another side of the, the world, there's, a, there's still a, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. And yeah. Philippines so general. Are- definitely find a way. <laughs> I mean, you guys got both the life. I don't know how that made it from here to there. And, <laughs> yeah, but and, like, and he's yeah. got a Castellone that came from Altman's, and that made it from here to there. 
uh, a friend of mine who's growing all uh, succulent plants. He has a brother-in-law there in California. He bought it at Altman Plants, and he yeah, shipped yeah, it here. So yeah, they, I am not surprised. We we've had them for some time, and I mean it's kind of amazing. It's almost awe-inspiring when you can look at a a bed a hundred feet long with Castellone in it. So pretty amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that actually answers my question. <laughs> I'm, about, about, I'm about to ask the question uh, or to ask uh, if there would uh, if there's a uh, uh, partner uh, nursery or garden near uh, the uh, Philippines or the Asia where we can also acquire the uh, their hybrids. Well, I, I do know that we're going to be shipping wherever Home Depot goes and wherever Love goes. So I don't know. I mean, there's a Costco in the Philippines, isn't there? Yeah, so that's actually uh, uh, one of the reasons why the Philippines, I mean, we have the uh, our very uh, delayed, uh, you know, collection of your hybrids, uh, probably you created a year, I mean, a decade or 15 buyers. years ago. <laughs> you apply the screws to those buyers that work for those companies. You go, why don't we have these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll try to make it happen, <laughs> then we'll find out. <laughs> I turned the light down, but I think I need to get it a little higher. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. They want to see you more, Kevin. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> so, so far, based on your probably hundreds or thousands of hybrids, what's your current top three? That's a cruel question. That's like asking, I have three boys. Which one's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever right. one I'm talking to. Um, in terms of the plants that I'm most proud of, probably something like a blue glow. I mean, that's a, a, an agave. It's not an aloe. And the aloes, I, I don't know. I, I, I think Christmas sleigh is pretty good um, in terms of the numbers that are out there and the color. And um, I, I just like it. It's, it, it appeals to me. And uh, it's commonly available. It's, it's really bad when you say, well, your favorite is one that nobody can get. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's that's not good. If you see in the background on either side of me, I've got agave alba pilosa and agave uh, the aborospina. The, the the aborospina is my favorite of all agaves, mm -hmm. and that grows in California. So I don't even have to go that far to go see it. Um, but I, in terms of what you like and what is most popular in terms of the marketplace, it, it's back to that thing when I said aloes of unusual color, because I like them and think they're cool. There's a small group of people that are like you and me and mm -hmm, we like mm -hmm. weird things. There's a large group that wants bright red or bright oranges and look like fuchsia painted uh, things. And those seem to be the most popular. So, um, uh, likewise, if they're popular for other people, then that tends to make me like them. But I'm more of the, I like the yellows and the grays and the, the mauves and the kind of off colors that, that just kind of look trippy. Yeah. So we have a, we have a controversial question here, but I'll leave you if you're going to answer that or not. <laughs> controversial. <laughs> Yes. So what's your take on people buying your name aloe hybrids, making their own hybrids out of them and putting their names on them? I, I don't have any problem with it. I mean I, I I if the only way I would have a problem with it is if I if I put it out there and didn't expect them to do that. I mean the, when I sold the first one I knew they would do that. What I don't like is when they're not honest about it. When they say, mm -hmm. Oh, I crossed this with aloe brunzii. You know, well, Brunzia is a little tiny species with a yellow flower that has kind of smooth leaves. And the plant they show has these big scallops with bumps all over it. And I'm going, okay, well, you crossed it with something other than Brunzia. So let's be honest about it. And what they won't say is that they crossed it with Karen Zimmerman's and one of Dick Wright's and one of mine. Mm -hmm. And if they say that, then I feel like it's it's more truthful and honest. Um, you guys kind of know what a Kelly Griffin aloe looks like because it's been around so long. Um, and in terms of pictures, you know, the ones with the neon lights days, I mean, that was 1998 when I first came out with that. And I see stuff come out now and it goes, oh, it's a new new variety from even my former employee employer. And I go, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's just... <laughs> 
you know, it's like when, uh, you know, they make the candy bar smaller and, and they tell you it's the new and improved, you kind of go, well, no, the candy bar is smaller and it's not improved. So uh, right. that's the thing. I, I, everybody th wants to make it a controversy. I have no problem with, with Karen because she's very upfront about, you know, what she's done with her plants. Um, uh, and she's done a great job and she's created plants that I haven't created, you know, but I, it's nice to know that I had a, a helping hand in making some of her plants and that she acknowledges that, you know, because, you know, a lot of like plants like DZ that has confetti in it and a lot of them have KG number five in it, but she's gone a different direction than I would have gone. And in some cases she's arrived at a similar place than I have, but they're still her hybrids and I don't have any problem with that. Again, to, to reiterate one point is that if they say it's something different than what it is, then I want to call them out on it. It makes you sound like you're the, um, the naysayer. And I don't want to really want to do that. But I, I just think, you know, Dick, if it, if it looks like a Dick Wright hybrid, it ought to have some credit given to Dick Wright. And Dick Wright hybrids tend to have that little star shape with Boinsy, and they have tremendous texture. No question, they have tremendous texture in them and some of the best texture and teeth. What was missing for some of the Dick Wrights for me when I discovered Dick Wright hybrids was color. He didn't have a lot of color and the color came from the Madagascar species and also from some of the South African species that were really big that people wouldn't have thought, hey, you can use those big species, and breed them back down. The scalloped teeth came from Aloe divericata and that's a, a, a bushy shrubby tree aloe in Madagascar. So mm -hmm. a lot of those characteristics come from other places. And I, I don't know, I guess I just want people to not be so like, oh, this is my secret hybrid. I crossed two of my friends' hybrids together and came up with this new secret one. <laughs> so I guess that's, that's all. And so, I, so do I work with grass like aloes? You know, I came up with a, a real um, non sequitur here. Um, I called it grassy lassie, and it was uh, a, a very obscure grass aloe uh, called uh, aloe inyangensis, the Kimberly form. And I crossed that with aloe bellatula, and I named it, it was an F1. It wasn't even an F2, it was an F1. And I named it grassy lassie, and it was really popular for, I want to say, about maybe five or six years back around 2000. 2008 somewhere in there and people were buying it and using it in the landscape and it's kind of fallen out of fat fashion because people aren't tissue culture anymore but i've done a few grass aloes the problem with a lot of grass aloes is they tend to have a real pronounced um dry period where they almost go away or disappear and that's a problem you know nobody wants a plant that you plant it in the ground and it goes away and then you think it's dead and you pull it out and throw it away when it's just kind of going dormant so that it, that can be an issue but what do a, what a grass aloes really bring to the equation? Uh, Inyang Ensis had a really nice orange flower, and that's why I was drawn to it. Um, but most of the grass aloes have kind of an inconspicuous in flower, don't look like much. A Modesta right. has a fragrant flower. That's another thing is that you, you, there are a, a number of species that are fragrant, and they're very nicely fragrant. Um, everybody always mentions Hawartheoides, which kind of smells like Jim Swiftsock to me, but uh, Compressa and uh, Florencia and Modesta all have a very nice fragrance. And it's a recessive gene, so if you want it, you've got to cross something with it, cross something else with it, and then cross those two together, grow them out, flower them, and then keep working on it because it's a recessive gene. But right. you could conceivably have a really colorful aloe with fuzzy flowers that is fragrant, and that would be really cool. All so right. So do that. Make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even even the characteristic of the flowers would change, right? Or yeah, hybrid. everything everything's a, 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 a gamut. I, I don't know if anybody has done any rose hybridizing, but I always marvel at the people that have done the rose hybridizing because they'll come up with some really fantastic kaleidoscope flowers and some really beautiful colors that you just don't see in roses. But generally, along with that comes a crappy growing plant that gets disease really. So you know, it's always a trade-off. The idea is to get the perfect color and the perfect shape and, and disease resistance and good growth habits. It's a lot of work to get there. 
You know, it, you have to keep trying and, and failure only means you haven't gotten there yet. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means you haven't gotten there yet. Right. So just keep dreaming and pushing for. <laughs> well, for part of that is, is, is envisioning it. When you, when you go, right. like you're going to hybridize plants. I, I hear so many people go, oh, well, I crossed this aloe with this aloe because they were blooming. That's a terrible reason to cross two plants. You know, if you want to cross something, think about what you're going to combine to create something. And if you don't, then, then you're kind of just doing what a hummingbird would do. And you're, you're going to be <laughs> random in your, in your success. On the other hand, if something has really neat lines in it, cross something else that has really neat lines in it and see if you can either amplify the lines or um, get a different shape with those lines. Or if something has really nice teeth, cross it with something else that has really nice teeth and then recross it and recross it until you amplify those characteristics. If something has a really neat yellow color, we're getting some really nice yellows and kind of green yellow colors. You just keep working in that direction. Right. So Sean is asking top three books or website to learn more about species. <laughs> uh, wow. Top three books about aloes to learn about species. Okay, well, first of all, anybody that was seriously, you're going to have to do like a book search, and that's not easy in, in COVID time, but uh, get Reynolds' books, because Reynolds' books on aloes are unsurpassed. I mean, there's the South African one, and then the Madagascar and Tropical Africa. Those are the best on all the aloes that were known before he passed. Um, subsequent to that, there are books like, um, for Madagascar, Castellon's book is pretty good. There's some things I have that are nit nitpicky. Um, a lot of the translation from French to English is like, there's like four, four uh, paragraphs of French and then there, the English translation is three sentences. And I, <laughs> you know, I, think, I think there's something lost in the translation here. But to make a long story short, um, generally that's kind of a nice picture book of, of what is represented. Uh, the Rao books, uh, on Madagascar succulents have really good sections on aloes, both of them. And uh, so I would say the Rao books, which are still available, those Rao books on Madagascar succulents um, at a pretty reasonable price. Those are really good investments. But those would be, I think, my top three. Uh, you could get the, um, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the, the definitive aloe guide. So I got to tell you the story about the definitive aloe guide. So I contributed mm -hmm. some photos to that book and, and I was told that I didn't contribute enough to warrant getting a copy of it, which is fine. It didn't really, didn't really phase me one way or another. I contributed photos because they asked me to, not because I was expecting something. But I, at the time um, that the book was being distributed, I was in Madagascar. And I came back from Madagascar having found three new species of aloes. And on my front doorstep from the queue, queue uh, was this book. And John had said that I did warrant getting a copy and he'd, he'd sent me a fine copy, uh, John Lovano did. And so I got one anyway without asking, which was really nice. Because one, one of the authors had said I, I hadn't done enough and John said he has done enough. And, uh, and it was kind of a surprise. But I, I found it really funny when I'm looking at this book, it's a definitive aloe guide, and I know of three aloes that aren't in it. You know, it's like, and absolutely new aloes that weren't in that book. You know, so, I mean, it wasn't a question that my interpretation was that they were new aloes. These were aloes that I hiked 18 miles off of a road to go, go see. So um, it's not likely anybody else would have gone and, and seen them and done that. But um Anyway, to make a long story short, I, I thought the, I probably would have used the word definitive because definitive is short lived. <laughs> yes, you are, we are just going to discover one, one new thing every now and then. I, it's going to happen. I mean, Castellone was discovered in 2002. You know, I mean, wow. beautiful little species. So it's, it's a new species as far as I mean, in, in the terms of modern botany, that's 18 years ago. So that's like nothing. You know? You know, how long have been people been looking at aloes since the 1800s, 1700s? So, yeah, I mean, there's still new stuff. You know, there's enough new stuff out there. And probably some of it's kind of crappy and not, not that interesting. And probably some of it's very, very cool. 
Uh, you know, the Alba Pilosa, the over my shoulder here, where is it? There, uh, there. Uh, that was discovered in 2000. I mean, it was actually discovered in the 19, 1990s. I say discovered, made aware of by science, but it wasn't, it wasn't described until 2000. So that's only two decades ago. And look how fantastic that plant is. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you, you think about there's things like that still out there that we just don't know about. And then, of course, there are hybrids. And then we have we have one more. Correct. Uh, Eva, so we have a question here. What tips would you give to someone who? I see the question, uh, Eva. I would suggest go sooner rather than later. Don't wait till you get old like me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would encourage you to go. But but you know maybe wait till COVID. We get a vaccine or or immunity, or maybe you get a good case of it and you survive it, I don't know. Um, I, I highly encourage people to see the plants in the wild. It changes you. And it's the kind of difference that you get from uh, seeing a concert live. You know, it's like you see a, your favorite music group live. If they're really bad, you probably will never play one of their, their CDs or one of their MP downloads again. But if they're really good, you're like hooked for life. And that's the way plants are. If it's really a lot of trouble and you get uh, bitten by fleas and stung by wasps and you don't find the plants in very good condition, you probably never want to go grow that plant again. But when you see the beauty that's in the wild, uh, it, it becomes very addictive. You want to go see more and, and study it more and take pictures because they're beautiful. Um, I would encourage you, and I would also encourage you if you're wondering, go with a group if you can that's in your kind of group. If you're really into plants, go with a plant group. If you're really into birds, go with a bird group. Because if you go with a bird group and you're looking at plants, you're not going to see very many plants. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying that, you know, be, be like-minded. Um, the yeah. nice thing about somebody like Jeremy Spath and Brian Kimball, Brian's a, an aloe god to me. I mean, he just knows aloe's like nobody's business. And Jeremy is, is much younger, but but he has a path and an interest and an ability to just say yes to going to go see the plants. So with that in mind, I mean, so many plants you can go see and they're there. And the longer you wait, the fewer that seem to be there because uh, Madagascar is not what it once was. But there's still nice plants there now. Yeah. Well... So why aloes, and uh, are you also into cacti? Um, my nursery, we grow thousands of cactus, and I, I'm well-versed in cactus, and I, 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 if I were being totally honest, I would say I'm a better uh, succulent grower than I am a cacti grower. Cacti generally do better in a greenhouse. Cacti generally do better when uh, you're really into them, and I, I am somewhat. I, I've been to all the astrophytums in the wild, and I've been to all the furrow cactus that I can think of in the wild and seen them, take pictures of them and studied them. Uh, I just find them cacti much less forgiving. If you, if you grow an aloe badly and it starts looking terrible, you core it and it makes five babies, you're back in business. If you grow a cacti badly, um, it's ugly cacti for a long time. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, it, it's one of those things. I, I think that they're more forgiving. But I don't know if you saw my garden. There are cacti in my garden. So I, I have some Pilosus cereus, and I have some Trichus uh, cereus that I've grown from seed, and some of a few Apuntias even. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Well, th there's a lot for episode two, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I can do one on agaves, too. I'm sure that sure wow. we'll We'd love yeah. that. <laughs> so, so I think we, we have not discussed this um, a bit because we are so amazed with your collection. But um, any basic or general care for, for aloes, like if, they, if we are going to have them in pots? Okay, well... I can say this, most of the hybrids, at least the ones that I've bred and named, I've bred them to be easier to grow and to do mm. in a small pot, most of them. There's a few that, that are more difficult depending on the parentage, uh, but 
the, the thing about hybrids is they tend to have hybrid vigor, which means they tend to be a little stronger, um, mm. but not always. And um, if, if they're not stronger, then they're the ones you want to stop working with. That's the other thing. Yes. You know, if you're not going forward, you're going backward, then you're, you're in the wrong, wrong group. But uh, in general care, it varies so much depending on your environment. Some people live in a very hot and humid area, and humidity means you have to water a little bit less. And some people live in a very hot, dry area, and it means they have to water a little more and maybe provide a little more shade. And some people live in coastal environments, which are generally ideal because coastal environments, if you don't water, the plants survive. And if you do water, they seem to dry out okay. And it's just like, it's like a nice mix of things, you know, um, but it really, I think you'll find out that certain things you grow and certain things say no. And, and that's what we tend to gravitate, gravitate to. I have friends that live in very hot, dry areas. Boy, they love growing cacti, but they can't. They grow them really well, and they don't even have to work at it. Uh, on the other hand, there's things that they can't grow, like tillandsias, because they dry out in, in 15 minutes and they're dead. So, you know, everybody has their niche. And for me to tell people how to grow stuff in places different than where I am, uh, I can't tell you too much. I have been working on projects with agaves trying to make more cold tolerant ones so that people live in these marginal areas can grow them and have something more than just a perii to grow. So that was one of the things that we are working on. Yeah. And I think I've asked you um, this before with regards to, you know, because um, when when we are seeing um, South African uh, plants like aloes or cacti in general, um, which most of them, the initial assumption is that they are grown from the desert. And uh, well, here in the Philippines, we are tropical. And then you mentioned something about it's. It, there are really some areas that are also tropical where you get aloe species, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, very tropical. And sometimes even within the context of uh, moving from state to state in South Africa, you go from areas that are very dry to areas that are very moist and some get winter rainfall and some get summer rain rainfall. Um, and, and they just vary. I mean, it, they're like all over the map. So there is no like fast, and I mean, 500 and some odd species, there is no fast rule for where one particular plant will do better. Uh, we generally gravitate towards plants that are more tolerant of a wide range of characteristics within the climate. And those are the ones we tend to like more. And that's what I was saying. Castellone, Castellone it grows on, on these cliff faces, but it gets, um, it's open to the ocean. And these cliff faces, are kind of across away from the plane, but the dew and the fog comes right off the ocean and hits these these cliffs, even though they're you know a couple of miles inland, and they're far to bed. And so the plant's very tolerant of not getting watered for a while, and it's growing in limestone, so it's very keen on that. But it doesn't seem to be too sensitive to being overwatered, which is not surprising because a lot of plants do have coastal influence that seem to be a little more tolerant of getting moisture at odd times of the year because that coastal influence tends to come and go and if rot was going to take you out it would have done it and you wouldn't have been able to survive there um but uh, there are certain deadlias and certain agaves that just want to be dry i mean they just want to be dry they don't want any uh you know winter rain at all some deadlias don't want any summer rain at all so there are certain plants that just they will not grow long term, whereas some species of the same genus will do just fine for you. So um, I'm not sure that, like I said, giving directions, I mean, I was a little cautious about this, is giving directions on what works for other people, particularly when I don't live there, it's really tough. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen people grow things quite well in conditions that I would think you couldn't do it but they've figured it out. Um, they've probably made adjustments in the terms of how they water, or maybe the way they water, or the soil amendments they use to make their soil drains quicker. Um, there are a lot of different things you can do to adjust to those environments. And they're the things that I haven't had to consider because I live here. Um, All right. um, generally, I've bred the plants to grow well in small pots and do fine in 
um, overcrowded conditions because that's kind of what I was breeding for. I was thinking about these little sea urchin-like plants growing in rock cracks. And so if, if you think of them in that term, I think you can grow them a lot better. A lot of my aloes, my hybrids, I see people growing them in too low of light. And then they look like big green nothing. You know? If they're not coloring up right and they're one of my aloes, you might want to consider putting them in a little more light if you can. It, it, gradually. You don't want to take it from a closet into the bright sunshine. But uh, generally, if they're not very colorful, that's what's missing is the light on it. Right. It's, it's, I think it's just a weird characteristic for for plants uh, because for some reason they or they appear more beautiful when they are stressed, not like humans. <laughs> oh, we we can't hear you, Kelly. He's in mute. Probably the board. Again. Right now. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> My cat was here helping me. I have a cat. <laughs> so it's the cat unplugging. I, I, I thought the tail was a, I mean, it's a microphone with a wind filter. <laughs> I have a wind microphone and I have a whole crew here helping me for this COVID. <laughs> And, and on aloes. No, I have a cat. His name is Pisco. Like, like the, the the drink from uh, the wine drink from uh, Peru and Chile. Mm -hmm. He's a little, a little sweet kitty today. He's just laying right here, right next to me. That's uncommon for him. He usually <laughs> a little bit more of a character. He likes yes. to walk across the middle of the of the screen and get in front of you. <laughs> So, Brixie, I think you have a question. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, actually, um, having said all of those things, it's actually uh, changed my perspective in hybridization in my own little, you know, hybridization project. And uh, Write it down. Uh, just, no, because... Um, write thinking, if you write it down, then it's a goal to get to. I mean, there's things yeah. I have to share with you guys because there's, there's goals that I'm trying to work on, and I'm not there yet. So... And here it is, it's doing what, 30 years? So, yeah, it's true. <laughs> or else you, uh, you will end up you know, creating a lot of uh, the garbage, and the junks. <laughs> yeah, but along the way, you end up creating a lot of cool things. So, that's. Yeah. I mean, there's a few, I've, I've named a few hybrids of agaves or a few hybrids of, uh, uh, and cultivars of uh, aloes and whatnot. So, yeah. It's kind of nice right. that you're out there. Okay, so for, for my last question probably would be, uh, what would be your uh, top uh, three uh, uh, tips or uh, general rule for uh, aloe collectors? Grow what you're passionate about. If you don't like aloes, Sorry. don't grow them. If you love <laughs> aloes, grow the crap out of them. I mean, it's it's the thing is if you if you don't love it, you're not going to stick with it. If you're just collecting names, mm -hmm. don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, try to write down some of the, your goals with your breeding if you're going to spend any time doing it. If you're going to just say, I want to make something, write it down what you want to make because then it's something to look down and go, okay, am I getting there? And if I'm not getting there, how do I get there? Okay, I want the leaves to be redder go out and acquire some of the red leaf species. If you want more teeth, go out and acquire a with the real spiny teeth and, and use that when it flowers. And it's a bit of work because you got to grow it up and get it to flower. So these are these can be long-term goals, but if you never write it down, it'll never happen. Um, I don't think. I mean, you, you, won't get there because you won't be focused. And, and that's hard because it, it is a lot of work. When you go to Think about like hybridizing agaves. I mean, you got to go collect some seed. You grow the seed for eight to 12 years, get it to bloom. Mm -hmm. You got to stick a ladder out in your backyard and go, go climb that ladder. And you got to put pollen from another plant that you collected on that. And then you got to collect the seed and then you got to mark the seed and then you got to grow the seed. And then you got five or six years before you figure out if you even got something. So it's, it's a slow process. Aloes allow you to do it for about a year. You can start seeing pretty good results in you know eight months or a year. 
you know, that your seedlings will start flowering. And the ones that don't, you can just ditch because they're not going to be something you can work, work with and continue. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So oh, somebody wrote good advice. Chile. Yes, Chile is one of my favorite places, Martin. I absolutely <laughs> love Chile. And, and actually, Pisco was named after we made a trip to Chile. We had, I just didn't want to insult people because the Peruvians claim uh, Pisco sours, but the best ones I've had have been in Chile. So I'll probably get in trouble for that from all the Peruvians. But the best, uh, the best uh, Pisco sours I had were in Alcal in Chile. And I've been to almost all of the Copiapoas. So, yes, it's a beautiful plant, and I grow them. There's, they actually grow quite well here in San Diego in the ground outside. So I have a Hazeltoniana that has maybe 20 heads in the ground in California. Yeah. Well, that's... Uh... So, Martin, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to know you got friends uh, from the Philippines in, in Chile. <laughs> yeah, I think we're bringing broadcasters from, uh, broadcasters, pro broadcasted from, from the whole world. Some, a lot of people are looking wow. at you, Kelly. So. I, I would <laughs> tell you too, uh, Martin, if you're still listening there and you're still on there, Google Alt Altman Plants and there's kind of a catalog of a trip I took to Chile with some nice photos. I think you'd be interested. Um, all you have to do is Kelly Griffin at Altman Plants, and it, it's got some nice pictures. And I, I really do love uh, Copiapoas, all of them from the littlest Lowies to the, the biggest Cranesianas. They're just a fantastic group of plants. Yeah, I, I have to say, really honestly, I'm a generalist. I, I every mm -hmm. says you're an aloe specialist, but I, I, I love plants, and I, I, I've been to places like you know, I went to Maui to go look for. Uh, uh, Portulacaria, um, when it was it, uh, Portulacaria malakiniensis, um, mm -hmm. it was on the little uh, islet, and uh, also to see Brighamia and uh, Archiroxophyum sanduens and uh, up in Haleakala. So th there's a lot of plants that I, I've gone to take pictures of and studied, but you know, like the silver swords, I can't grow them here. I grew one up to about a six inch pot size and then killed it. So. There are certain things you can just see in nature and appreciate and love, and that's got to be enough. Yeah. You can't have everything. Have, have you tried collect, uh, coming here to Asia to collect plants? I have not. I, I have been to yeah. Australia, yeah. but I've never been to yeah. Asia. Yeah, actually, I received a, a private message asking if you have plans to visit Philippines soon, <laughs> or even after the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> I would, I would love to visit the Philippines. I have not done it yet. And I, that's one yeah. of my, where I worked before, um, they would sponsor some of my trips. So I had to go, and this is kind of interesting because um, how I got my current job at Altman is that my boss, I guess, traveled to Thailand and came back with a really special aloe. And when he brought it back to um, the nursery, one of the other breeders said, oh, well, that's really Griffin's aloe. <laughs> And it had gone to Thailand, and my father was there and was very impressed with it. And it was one that was being produced over in uh, San Diego. So it's kind of funny. That was one of the, my legs up on getting the job is that my boss liked my plants in Thailand. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's cool. So a lot of following from, from you, Kelly. So um, I, I think that this is the part wherein we are just going to um, give our other um, panels, unless you have any other questions for from Kelly. Kelly, I don't. I, I hope you don't mind because we Not are right. two uh, hours. Well, I'm to up and I hope I wish you guys all good luck, and um, I hope I meet you in face to face sometime and see how fantastic your work has become. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love. Hey. We'd I love to come visit you. Clearly, your gardens are, are superlative because I, I, I saw pictures of dams, and I, I can just imagine. Um, you know, that's I see four other people up there with a lot of passion. So just yeah. keep it up. Just keep doing what you love. Thank you. It, it'll reward you. It may not, may not reward you monetarily, but you'll be able to keep doing it and be happy, happy people. <laughs> that means a lot coming from the top breeder like you 
<laughs> hey, I'm just a nerdy plant guy that that that's got, got noticed. That's about it. Like I, I didn't go, hey, I'm gonna do these really cool plants and everybody's gonna love them. I just said I love plants. Let's make some cool ones and see what happens. So it's just a byproduct. And it's funny, I've had people ask me about Dracula and I'm going, I'm so past Dracula. <laughs> like, I, I look at it and I go, uh, it's a great name, but the plant's not quite there. So I'm sorry to anybody that's selling Dracula. I don't want to don't want to hurt your sales or anything, but <laughs> about ten years behind at this point. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mention a lot of people ask me about the older ones like dental work and neon lights. I mean, neon lights was a superlative plant and it gave rise to so many, so many plants, but I don't even use it in my hybridizing because the, the generations that have followed are so much above that, you know, it's like, well, don't you ever use those? The only one I ever use really is sunrise um, occasionally because it, it has such nice blooms and such good, strong growth characteristics and offsetting. So there's some that I still go back to, but most I, I, I just don't even use. I, I have next things up, you know, above that. Is that a question? I'm not sure. Oh, <laughs> we'd love to invite you in think, the yeah. cactus and succulent convention someday. <laughs> yeah, I think it's for Dan and Sir Jello that would be great. to work on. <laughs> I, I'd love to come. We in, I, I've spoken at the Australian Society, and they asked me again to come. I guess I I didn't bore them too much the first time, um, so <laughs> I'm doing that in 2022. So hopefully we'll be back past COVID. Um, yes. And uh, I've uh, I've done a couple in the United States, and I've I've done a few in Mexico, but not, nothing really major. But I, I like I like talking about plants, and I, I think I have a lot to share. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting. <laughs> Last <laughs> time we had Mr. Keith Kitori. <laughs> you had what? Uh, we had Keith Kitori. Oh, Keith, uh, the yeah, potter. Keith, yeah. pot. oh, we we tr I trade Castellones with him for his pot. <laughs> He's a marvelous <laughs> pot maker. I mean, his his. See, that's the kind of thing that I'm. I, I see a, a very much a, a, um, a Keith's pots being his art expressed in clay. It doesn't look like other people's pots. It's his pots. And I, I mean, same thing with some of the other potters that we have. They express their art through their, their media. And to me, that's kind of the way I felt with my plants. And so when people go, what about this other hybridizer doing that? Well, they're, they're expressing their art too. And some of them are unfortunately are just mirroring you, but but mm -hmm. occasionally they finally figure it out and they find their groove and they start making stuff that's that's unique and different. And uh, there you go, you got Here's one. To my you know, it's funny when I, Here's I my Keith spot. I haven't used it yet. <laughs> oh, you're waiting for the right plant for it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, yes, that's so, right. Uh, I'm waiting for the right plant. <laughs> these pots are so organic. They really are. Um, yeah. One of the plants that was on the shelf there was the Keith, Keith pot that I would hand to. But, you know, if you don't stop long enough, you wouldn't have figured it out. Yeah. So, Keith, if you are watching, do a shout out here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you yeah, know, the, you know the, the, we miss you. We used to see Keith at all the shows no. in town. But we've already canceled one, and we're probably going to cancel another one. So, uh, we like to get back to life as normal, but hopefully safely. Yeah, but you know that Keith is half Filipino, right? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I do know that. I don't hold it against him. <laughs> After knowing us, <laughs> he's he's a super he's a super artist. I really I really admire him. Yeah. Right. Correct. Yeah. So I um. So there. Uh, so when is our agave session? Uh, I can't get you on the spot here. <laughs> so the last trip I made before COVID was to Nayarit, Mexico, and. Um, I say before COVID, we were, it was just like everybody was starting to wear masks and people were looking at people and it was very odd and we were like, there's something up. What's going on? You know, it's like and sometimes you feel like you're in Mexico, you let you got a tune, but we weren't. We we were getting the really close. Fortunately, I think we got back in time and you know, the thing about traveling in Mexico where we were, we were up in the hills looking for plants. So we were 
so far away from people, I felt really safe. But, you know, right now, the worst part is getting on an airplane. And everybody knows that. So yeah. um, right. anyway, that was the last trip. And I, I have some great photos of we went to see Agave Impressa. And I don't know if I've shown you Agave Impressa. This is, this is way off subject. But let me just pull up one picture of Impressa and see if it impresses you. <laughs> Impress the Impressa. Let's see if I can do this. Give me just a second. I'm working on it. <laughs> so those are part of the thousand pictures. Yeah, I just have to get back to the right thing. <laughs> Beginning of March, so it's not that hard. It's, it's really in, interesting to breed uh, agaves because they take too long to bloom. So you probably have something to induce their flowers. Um, yeah, you know, we can induce flowering in, in vitro. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we've worked on. Are you guys asleep yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the middle of the actually. It's actually close to noon here in the Philippines. It's 11... 41 a.m. here in the Philippines. It only took me 20 minutes to find this. No, I got it. Here it is. Uh, let's see which is a good photo. Okay, so I'm going to share this. Can you see that share screen? Can you see that? Yes. Did you, did you already have it? Um, we lost it. Uh, we have it already. How about that? Oh, there. yes. Yep. The spines are impressed. Yeah, isn't that pretty nice? It's impressive. <laughs> yes. So anyway, I, I did a talk on agaves, but about that trip, and that was one of the, the nicer clones, but I showed lots of pictures of what typical ones look like and what that one looks like. So there you go. Anyway, one picture, it's not an aloe, but it, it's kind of a rosette shape, and it looks kind of like an aloe, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are looking forward to our episode for agave. <laughs> Do I hit stop sharing or is that going to kill me? There we go. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think it, it, it's, uh, it's not as quite as diverse as aloe. I mean, agaves, you've got probably 125 to 130 species. Mm -hmm. But within the context of that, you have incredible diversity. So, you know, like, for example, if you were to tackle a complex like Utahensis, they range from everything the size of a softball to the size of um, a large beach ball, you know, and everything from blue to green to white spines to black spines to wiggly spines. So there's so much variation that you could look for days and see all the different variations of it. And that the plant that I showed of Impressa is not a typical Impressa. It's an exceptional Impressa. But that pop particular population has more of those than the others. So it's a little bit, you know, one of those things that we like so much about hybridizing is that you can breed for that. And I imagine if you had that plant in um, cultivation, you could cross it with something like agave pentia and make it even weirder. So there's all these potentials that go through your mind. Um, and the nice thing that I can say about going for agaves in the wild is that if you can get there at the right time and they're flowering, you can get a, a couple of anthers from the flowers that are fading and mm -hmm. you're knocked off eight or nine years of, of hybridizing because you've got the pollen, you come home with the pollen, you can put it on something. Right. So, so whereas if you've got like 10 or 15 seed and brought them back, started growing them, you'd be eight to 12 years out to be able to do your first breeding. So there's that going too. Right. I'm giving you all the great secrets. <laughs> but, but it's really good in terms of, you know, I'm working a lot with the conservation. 
If you collect a small amount of seed, a small sample of seed or a small bit of pollen, you're not doing a huge degree of, of damage to the population. And if you collect a seed, a single seed, you can tissue culture a seed and essentially almost not affect the wild population at all. You know, a lot of these plants produce a thousand seed and of those thousand, if the population is stable, one of the, th one of the thousand is gonna grow to adulthood. And if you take 15 or 20 seeds, you're really having no impact on, on the environment. Um, but then you have the ability to take the best of those 10 or 15 or 20 th seeds you get and grow the nicest clones of what's there. So. Right. Actually, it's one of the questions earlier. Um, when you when you do travel, so how, how do you get the plant? Uh, do you get the plant or you just get the pollen? Uh, pollen or seed generally is the, the, the way I would be looking at it at this point. Uh, the other thing is to get permission with your local governments, depending on what country you're in. Work with the botanist there. I mean, like you saw me with Ernst von Jarsfeld. At the time I, I was there visiting him, he was working at um, uh, Kirkenbach as the director. So traveling with him, if I saw something that was really exceptional, I told him I'd like some pollen on that. He could make a way for me to get the, the stuff without getting in trouble and dealing with uh, bad problems. I, I, I think the, the biggest curse is that we've, we've had this concept that co all collection is bad. And most collection is good if it's done in a way that allows the population to be stable and, and stays, stays okay. Um, the concept of going to a wild population and digging plants out of the wild with the intention of selling those as individual units that's really been problematic in, even in the States uh, with deadly as and agaves. So uh, we, we want to discourage that behavior, particularly when you can take a single seed and grow a thousand plants. You don't need to, to, to rape the, the wild because we want hundred years from now, people to be able to hike up those same hills that I did and see the same thing. We don't want it to all be gone. I don't want my kids, kids to not see it. Yeah. What if one yes. of them, to have a passion of plants. I want them to be able to go visit them too. And and it's good that uh, they allow this instead of prohibiting the collection because prohibiting makes it uh, more uh, dangerous for the population in the wild because if you allow a uh, collection of seeds, at least nurseries would be able to propagate them and sell it to this, right, and the and there's a lot of market now for uh, cultivated seed propagation, and that's something that we should work more on. When we get like 10 or 15 stock plants and get them to produce seed, share that seed with, with botanical gardens and with others, so there's not a constant drive to go back to the wild. Um, that, that's a, a very valid project. I, I think that there's so much we, we can do and so much we haven't addressed. One of the things that's nice is we're talking about the primarily with this talk, allo hybrids. Um, why are we talking about owl hybrids? Because they're really cool. They're more colorful. They're prettier. If you can make a plant in cultivation more cool than the ones that are in the wild, what does that do? It drives the market to the commercial aspect and not the wild populations. So right. in a very real sense, the, the concept of hybridization is kind of, kind of cool. I mean, if, if you could buy a hybrid tea rose or you could buy a four-petaled wild rose, what would you buy? you'd buy the, the hybrid tea because it's prettier. And, and so that's kind of what I want to also include in that concept is that if you can make something that's prettier and more colorful and easier to grow, wouldn't you want to grow that? And that plant can be reproduced um, in tissue culture and we can grow thousands of them. And right. there's no damage. They don't even occur in the wild. So there's no harm done to the wild. Right. Yeah, and and one of my conversation with um, Keith out there um, is that he mentioned um, there's, there's actually um, like a rule wherein they are when whenever they are going to try to develop um, new regions, they would reach out to to plant groups to you know have harvest them. Yes, for, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that makes logical sense because. Otherwise, they're going to end up. I mean, I was in Chile, and they they literally plowed the copiapoas to the ground because they were in their way. And I was just thinking, there's people that would die for that plant, just love to have one, and they're just rotting by the side of the fence. 
But that plant is a CITES-1 plant. So by Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, it's not going anywhere. And that's unfortunate because there are situations probably when those plants could have gone to good homes and been loved and taken care of. And, um, you know, even with the concept of uh, a rescue, the way they've been doing rescues here is that the plants get tagged because otherwise people just say, oh, well, they go out to the desert and they dig one out and they said, oh, I was rescuing it. Well, loosey goosey, you don't rescue it from an area where it's just fine. And so there's a lot of that that, that goes under the auspices of being rescue. And that's the unfortunate aspect is when you create a loophole, some people that are unscrupulous will just manifest and find a way to monetize that uh, loophole. And that, that's happened. Some of those agave, the agave Utah instances that are ending up in collections in Asia and other places are coming from the wild and it's not appropriate. Because, yeah, they're not a CITES plant, they're not protected, they're not CITES 1, but still they're coming out of the wild for no apparent reason because the areas that they're coming from are not being developed. So it's, it's kind of, I don't know, I, I, I'm really a little bit skeptical of people saying that uh, they were legally collected because they were rescued, you know. Rescue has to be because we're going to build a road through that area and you have to actually build the road. You can't just go up into the hills and say, well, they might build a road someday. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I hear people justifying. It's like when people that are thieves justify stealing. It's like, well, they're a big company. It really didn't matter. You know, it's like, come on. It's still wrong. Wrong yeah. is wrong. And, you know, that, that concept of uh, rescue plants, I'm, I'm really skeptical of it. But it, it, there is a way to do it. And they, they tag the plants for like the, the giant saguaros and some of the acateos. They tag them individually. And they're tagged with a license number so that the, if you buy one and it doesn't have that tag, you shouldn't buy it. And that's, that's kind of a good way to do it. But I have a lot of loosely called friends that I say, like more like Facebook friends, that would just go out into the desert and dig one and not think anything of it. And it's unfortunate because and that doesn't really mean you want to grow it. You just want to have it. If you really want to grow it, you go out and get a couple of seed and bring it home and tenderly take care of them in your garden and then grow them for eight or six years or whatever and, and get a nice plant. But if you want to have it, you just go dig it with a shovel and rip out all the roots and bring it home. So. Correct. All right. I think I've I've talked about nauseam. We were even talking about agaves now. So let's maybe pick it up. Um, yeah. If you have more questions, let me know. Yeah, actually, uh, this is one thing that we also want to um, show you um, is just with regards to how we do it here um, in the Philippines. Also, like to uh, for you to give your inputs uh, in terms of you know um, any any tips that you can give us in terms of how we do it here, or probably there there may be some things that we're we're doing here that you know can can also be applied there. So we can go through that. Um, as we go through with our other panelists here. Will that be okay with you? Sure. Okay, cool. So I think um, we are just going to go back uh, a little bit with Brixio. Um, it's just going to show um, some um, about aloe. So Brixio, are you ready? Yeah, so... Um... I had a hard time actually looking for a good uh, reference or uh, literature because uh, there's a very few or even, you know, you can only count, uh, you know, our write-ups about aloes in the Philippines. So uh, this is just a very quick fact. And uh, please don't expect too much on this, but uh, I, I, I will see what I can give you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we can go directly to uh, the slide number 12. Okay, slide number 12. Yeah, this is just a very quick one. All right. Got suddenly dark. I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> where's Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> there. Okay. You can go ahead. 
Okay. We can okay. proceed. All right. Okay. So um, the Philippines is a wide collection of different uh, plant species, and uh, based uh, in one article that I found, it was actually introduced uh, to us from the uh, uh, Malaysia Peninsula, Malaysian Peninsula to the Philippines, and uh, one of the uh, famous uh, species of aloe introduced to us is the aloe barbadensis. That's the uh, aloe vera, uh, as we commonly know it in, uh, in the Philippines or Sabila. And uh, aloes also, uh, as mentioned, grow in a wide variety of warm weather. So that makes our uh, climatic uh, requirement and uh, condition in the Philippines uh, suitable for them. Then, uh, as, as, as I've said, aloe vera is the most popular species in the Philippines, locally known as Sabila. And uh, a lot of people are referring to aloes as aloe vera. So, uh, but it should be the other way around. No? So, aloe vera is just uh, one species of, uh, species of the, of the, of the aloe uh, genus. And then uh, aloes also are neither native nor endemic in the Philippines. So in the next slide, I will be uh, showing you on how we acquired the, uh, the aloes. So we have two major sources of aloes in the Philippines. First is the local cultivation. So basically, these are already acquired uh, and uh, being propagated here locally. And... Uh, uh, commercially uh, cultivated also is the aloe vera, and uh, in the Philippines also this is uh, one of the uh, largest, uh, uh, what we call this, um, industry. This is the manufacturing of uh, certain medical and uh, uh, aesthetic products by using uh, aloes. And then uh, in the food industry also, the Food and Drug Administration approved aloe, aloe vera in particular as a native food uh, flavoring. And also in the uh, uh, Philippines, as a, a part of the local uh, sources, is the uh, hybrid propagation from the different nurses and from the collectors. So next uh, source that we have, of course, is the uh, international means. These are the imported aloes, uh, mostly for the uh, original species and hybrids. Now, listed here in my slide, uh, these are just the top uh, countries where we import our aloes. First, we have Thailand, mostly uh, on hybrid aloes. We also have uh, China, the U.S. Uh, we also have uh, from Indonesia, from Italy, and other parts of Europe. Then in doing this also, we just have to be uh, reminded with a set of protocols on importation set by the Bureau of Plant Industry. Uh, there should be uh, you know, a clear guidelines on the importation of uh, seeds and plant uh, materials. You can also uh, uh, take a look at this on their website. And uh, as the latest update of this, no, um, for those who are planning also to import aloes, uh, you need to secure specific permits to include the uh, aloe under uh, the ornamental classification and not uh, under the uh, cactus or the cacti and succulents. But uh, I know that other uh, requirements are also there, but uh, I just don't have uh, more details on this. But definitely, before you can import aloes or you can acquire aloes from uh, the other countries, you need to uh, observe certain protocols. Next slide, please. So these are just some uh, commonly uh, encountered tests and problems, but uh, this is just a brief introduction just to show to you what uh, kind of diseases uh, we've uh, experienced here in the Philippines. But I think uh, Kelly and Sridhan also will help us uh, in terms of the management of this and the proper care of aloe. So number one on the list is the aloe mites. This is also uh, termed as the cancer, aloe cancer. Uh, for, for, for aloe specific and what we also have here is the uh, I don't know if you can appreciate actually the, the picture Nakikita ba siya, Sir Jello? It can be seen but it can't be zoomed <laughs> <laughs> Alright, anyway uh, Okay, so next is the root rot So obviously from the word itself the, the, the rot originates from the roots itself so the plant looks healthy and uh, physically, but when you try to pull it out or to pull it, then you can see the the uh, the, the damage or the the rot, rotted part of the plant. 
We also have the other rust. This is primarily caused by a certain uh, fungal disease. And as a characteristics, you can see the blackened area. Parang ano siya, bilog siya. And there is a circulation that uh, does not uh, spread. Next slide, please. We have the soft rot. Uh, this uh, problem naman is uh, uh, caused by the A bacteria. And then uh, we have the leaf spot disease. I think this is also caused by a certain uh, uh, fungus. And this last uh, pest that I will mention to you is one uh, of the uh, pests that I am interested to, uh, and I'm also currently, uh, you know, studying. And this is a particular mite of unknown type. Uh, this is characterized by a very slow uh, progression, and uh, you can actually see the plant like, uh, you know, healthy on the outside. The, the structure is intact until it, uh, uh, you know, uh, reaches the, uh, uh, hello? No, yes. what I was going to say, what happens is that you, you, the, uh, the insect creates the wound and then the fungus contributes uh -huh. to it. So it's kind of a, a twofold thing. Uh, yes. bo both things are happening there. Uh -huh. the, the collapse isn't mm -hmm. just the, the, yeah. the insect. It's the insect opening a wound and then the moisture settling down those leaf mm -hmm. sheaths causing the fungus. So you have both. And we'll, we'll even get psyllids. And another sucking. Sorry to interject. You continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the problem with this uh, mite of a known type is that we're also trying to figure out what specific mite uh, is causing this uh, particular disease. Because you can actually see uh, patches like a, a bite mark on the uh, central growth point of the plant. And if you will try actually to uh, to uh, you know to examine the uh, stem or the lower part of the plant, you can actually see the uh, the damage, and then uh, this cannot be controlled by the uh, usual uh, pesticide or in insecticide that we have. Uh, and then uh, it has also the tendency to reoccur if you are not treating it properly, because uh, so, no, uh, as initial reading on this, uh, it involves a life cycle of this uh, pest, when uh, uh, repetitive application of a particular meticide is really recommended because if you will just try to uh, apply it once, then you will miss the, uh, the eggs, which have also the tendency to, uh, to, to uh, resist on the uh, meticide that you applied. So it should be on a repetitive uh, application. And then uh, the, the mole thing, is one of the characteristics of this disease. But uh, hopefully we can also give you more information as we, uh, you know, get uh, info, uh, additional knowledge and information about this disease. Um, Rachel, Next slide, does please. it spread fast? Yes. That does yes, it spread, it spread fast. fast. Uh, it, yes, the mechanism of uh, mite is that uh, it can actually transfer from one plant to another uh, by means of, uh, you know, air or, or wind. Kaya mabilis siyang kumakalat. So as advice for this particular infection, it's really uh, uh, recommended to isolate. If you have uh, observed this kind of infection in your collection, uh, to be safe. So physically, uh, what you can actually see is on the central point or part of the plant, yung gitna, may mga parang reddish bite marks na makikita. Yes. Okay. So Kelly, do you encounter the same issues? Um, no, I, what we what we would do is something like that. Is I would bag that thing and and, and find out what what it is. Because if you you bag it and send it to uh, here, we have like pest mm -hmm. um, pest uh, mm -hmm. determination. So they'll tell 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 you what you're dealing with. But I think you've got mm -hmm. two things. That what we normally do when we encounter something like that is we make the assumption it's a mite, and we also make the assumption mm -hmm. that. If it is a mite and it's causing some kind of damage, it's also probably going to cause some fungal problems all associated with it. So mm. we would treat it with a regular mm -hmm. system of miticide and then Systemic. change the miticide in two to four weeks. And then right. um, also at the same time, treat it with a fungicide because the, the secondary infections, it's kind of like when people get a cold, it's not the cold necessarily that kills you. It's, it's the cold weakens you and then your secondary infection comes in and kills you. So... Plants kind of go in that same kind of mm -hmm. thing. 
it's not necessarily the, the damage that the insects create as much as the wound that they open up that causes the pathway for other pathogens and other mm -hmm. uh, animals and interests of uh, keeping it like bugs and bacteria and viruses mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. enter. It's a pathway. Um, but yeah, but so again, identifying it is everything. Finding out what it is. If you think it's an, a mite, agree. Um, then take a plant that looks like it's just starting to get it, not one that, that's already died from it, because a lot of times mm -hmm. they move on. Bag it tightly and then have it identified. But I don't know that you guys have a, a source for an entomologist to do that. We, we do. So. Yeah. yeah so but I if you want to know what you're dealing with, then you can, you can treat it. If you know what you're dealing with, it's easier to treat. And some people go, well, it costs money. Go, yeah, well, assume that it's a problem that you might be able to take care of and go with that. Because as you said, it can go from plant to plant to plant to plant before it's too long, your whole collection's a, a mess. But treat it yeah. as if, as if, and then find out what the heck, heck it is. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm not familiar that, with that. Th th that's the assumption. Yeah, that is assumption, and we even call it the new allosalin killer because uh, um, this is not just the ordinary uh, disease that we've encountered, and uh, very less information is also available with this. And I think mm -hmm. what Kelly is saying is that we should not also target one specific pest, but we should also take note of the opportunistic ones <laughs> that could also, you, high, you know, high humidity there? kill the plant. Is your, you have high humidity? In the, yeah. yeah. Very high humidity. Yeah. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I think you're more susceptible to things that I'm not having to deal with because the humidity is an issue. Humidity gives you the ability for stuff floating in the air to land on stuff and start rotting it. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting black spot yeah. on aloes and gasterias, that's part of the humidity issue. You got to. The other thing you can do is increase your air movement. That would help if you think wasting money on fans is one thing, but. That air moving around is is a big lifesaver for a lot of plants. Right, and right. I don't think we nicely have, done, uh, by the way. Nicely done. Yeah, I don't. I don't think if we have that type of, um, for sure we have. I'll probably ask uh, Chong about it. <laughs> you know, if we can send plants, yeah, to them, um, and then really study what what that. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, about. we've uh, thought. I mean, I've talked with uh, Chong about this, and uh, there there should be a way to determine what type of uh, pest, specific pest, is uh, you know, actually causing this disease. So hopefully, we can uh, already uh, diagnose this, uh, so that we can also get uh, the appropriate treatment for this particular disease that we have. Right. Yeah, entomologists uh, are like plant geeks. They want to figure yeah. stuff out too. So. Yeah, we, we actually have a resident. We have a resident plant pathologist. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, 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 it, it, it's a passion. It's a, a passion I don't understand, but I, I'm trying to figure out how to kill them. <laughs> They're trying to figure out how to study them. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay so. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in the Philippines, also uh, we also have a lot of online support groups. This is um, through uh, through Facebook. We have uh, the Alo Philippines. Yeah, we also have the Mundo ng Alo. This is uh, the world of Alo and uh, the Philippine Alo community or the PAC. And for the international groups, we also have the Planet Alo, Enter the Alo, Alo Family, Alo Hybrids Forever, Alo Collector. So these are just some of the possible groups that uh, our fellow enthusiasts can also join so that they can also post uh, whatever questions or they can share also their experiences about Alos. And of course, uh, our own group, my mother uh, group, the Allo, nice to see you. Uh, hopefully you can also join us for those who are watching also. Thank you very much. So, in the last slide, please, let's say, yeah. Uh... Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, there. Yeah, I think uh, that's just my slide. It's just a, uh, you know, an introduction. Okay, and I think uh, Kelly, are you are you an ad or a part of any group there? I know of the All About Kelly group, Griffin group. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> also thinks that's like a, like an ego yeah. maniac. Uh, I didn't make that group. group. Uh, that's it's all like, about Kelly. <laughs> the, well, yeah, and I gotta say, but you know what's really nice about it is that there's a lot of people that know a lot about my hybrids that can answer the questions and I don't have to deal with it. So it's kind of nice. It's like, sometimes they're like my backup memory drive. If, <laughs> if I can't remember it, um, 
invariably one of them will have have the answer. So they're, they're, it's a wonderful group for that way. I didn't actually start it. Uh, Gina Julia did, and and uh, she um, asked me if she could, and I initially said no, and then I thought, well, why am I doing that? That's like a, a perfect out for me, because honestly, because there's people in that group that probably know more about Kelly Griffin Owls than I do. <laughs> so, so there's that. But I, I actually am a, an admin and moderator on the Planet Allo, um, and also on um, the Allo Underground. Um, both of those, I, I've I've had postings more Planet Allo than the other one, but um, uh, also Planet Agave and Planet um, uh, Gasteria. So yeah, I I help contribute to those. Uh, Barry's a friend and. Uh, he's a great guy, um, and so I've, I've helped him with some of those things, especially when it comes to some habitat photos where people get to see the plants, what they look like in the wild. They they seem to enjoy that, and I, I do too. It's a great thing. Right. But um, this is what opened my eyes because there was groups that he, uh, Brixia, put up there that I had never <laughs> heard of, and so now I'm going to have to do some Facebook <laughs> and figure out. They'll probably make me join. Yeah. <laughs> You probably have. I can't, I can't lurk, huh? Facebook. <laughs> I'm in mute. I just said that I just sent you the, an invitation. Mm. I think I'm going to resend it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. And then we, we just have a short course here um, of pollinating aloes from our resident hybridizer, Claire Hernandez. <laughs> Is fair. <laughs> you, it, it's going to be a pressure for you to pollinate in front of Ken. <laughs> I know. <laughs> don't, don't hurt yourself. They probably won't see it anyway because it's <laughs> the flowers are so small. Okay. Um. Wait. I have your pictures on. I think we can start with that. Yeah. Okay. There. Okay, that that would be my um go to tool for pollinating. Before um when I started with pollinating aloes, I used to use um artist brush, but right now I'm using um Tongs. tweezers because I find that it uh I I can give um specific um pollen. To, um, to a certain flower um, easily. So next slide. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. That's my slide. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem with this application. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that's. The, I'm just showing the part of parts of the flowers. Um, so usually, um, you cross pollinate uh, when you cross pollinate aloes, you take um, pollen from the anther of one, yeah, of one species or hybrid that you're working on. Uh, you get pollen from it, and then you. You take the pollen to another plant, to another aloe, and just, yeah, just stick it on the stigma. You okay. can see the stigma right there. Mm -hmm. So it has to be different plants, right? It, yeah, it mm. has to be. That's why uh, it, when you, it's called cross-pollination, right? <laughs> it has to be different plants. <laughs> I'm not sure. But you can. There are aloes, but can you do? There are aloes that can be self-pollinated, but um, I prefer to cross-pollinate it because um, uh, you can yeah you can create a different uh, characteristics of aloes with that if you yeah, like. You, even um, if you even if you're making um, more of the same species, cross-pollinating mm -hmm. two of the same species. You get more diversity mm -hmm. than if you try to self yeah. it, and mm -hmm. only certain ones will self. So you're you're wise mm -hmm. to do that to use more than one clone. Mm -hmm. Continue. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> so for 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 aloes, you don't need to 
remove the rest of the pollen on the stigma that you are trying to pollinate? Um, I sometimes remove it when it's uh and it gets in the way of the stigma. So um, you know, you won't your your pollen it won't get uh, contaminated by the pollen. Mm, okay. Mm. Sometimes the stigma isn't exerted either. In that case, you have to cut away mm. the parts to get to it. Because sometimes the stigma, is, in the picture she's showing there, she's got pollen on the end of the stigma, but sometimes the stigma is buried way up inside the flower. So in those cases, you have to cut cut away to get to it. Yeah, even the petals. I usually cut all the, the anther. Very good. <laughs> you're, you're so having yeah, to after <laughs> this is um so yeah after successful pollination, hopefully you get seed pods. That's that's the that's how the seed pods of aloes look like. So how long does it usually take to develop a seed pod? Usually it will take. Um, it depends on the aloe. Some some species or hybrids took a week, or some some takes two weeks. Mm. So we we have a question here. When is it best to pollinate? Is there a would would there be more chances of success if it has just opened or a few days after? Based on my experience. Um, because I do, I pollinate uh, a lot. I pollinate um, sometimes when I get up in the morning and then before <laughs> before I sleep, I pollinate. So, <laughs> I don't know. But it's best to pollinate right away or at least within the day so that um, this, the, it's, the stigma isn't, uh, hasn't dried yet. Any additional yeah, but, but 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 I think they're referring to the uh, to the to the donor, the pollen donor. Pollen donor. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Well, the pollen donor, the pollen is going to dehesce as soon as the uh, the petals yeah. open. Yeah. It'll start dehescing. It may take a, a half an hour, may take so, ten minutes, but sure, sure. but the pollen usually ripens before the stigma generally on the yeah. same flower. So that flower, the stigma will ripen usually a day later. Uh, the plants don't really want to self-pollinate. They want to outcross. Mm. Yeah, so that's why it's, 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 it's almost impossible for you to... Yeah. <laughs> yes, Bridget. Okay. Now, I was just saying that uh, that's why it's almost impossible for you to, uh, uh, you know, have a, uh, a self-pollinating uh, aloe because of the differences in the maturity of the uh, pollen and the stigma of the same, you know, flower. It's true, and, and the bees tend to, at least where we live, bees tend to steal the pollen. I mean, it, it'll, it'll be gone before the stigma ripens. Yeah. yeah, well, in my case, I don't have a lot of bees, but I have a lot of <laughs> flies. 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 Does flowering aloes have different time of day to pollinate them? Not really. Like not really. So it 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 regardless if what species it is, as long as it's as long as the pollen is available, you can pollinate it. I would say it's a very general statement. I've had seed pod development not take place in certain temperatures. Like if it's not right for the plant, like too wet, sometimes they'll rot off before they'll uh, they'll do yeah, it, it's particularly true. with some of the South African mm -hmm. stuff. But but generally, the, the, even the people that say that uh, Susan A is night blooming, which it's not, um, it, it, it's, if the seed, if the pollen is dehiscing and the stigma is ripe, uh, you can get pollination. You just the stigma is usually ripe when there's a little bit of stickiness to it, and it's usually well formed. And the pollen is ripe when you can see it dehiscing. It goes from those smooth looking anthers to kind of a powdery. It can be any color from light, light canary yellow to uh, almost a dark orange, uh, orange color. Mm -hmm. yeah. I usually right. don't pollinate in the afternoon because it's too hot here in the Philippines. <laughs> That's for you, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I do pollinate uh, early in the morning or uh, the night. Yeah. 
It's because I can uh, sense that the the stigma are uh, you know more receptive uh, compared to uh, other times of the day. Like uh, if it's uh, noon, it's very uh, hot, and uh, I think the stigma is very dry. That it's uh you know it's hard for you to uh, transfer the pollen and to make it receptive on it. Yeah. And I think the last uh, part is um, the last yeah, part. Yes. Yeah. I, I know that Sir Dan is very much ready already. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. just want, yeah. uh, when when's when's the time to harvest? So when the when the seed pod looks like yeah. this. Uh, right this one I have a sample here. Okay, so let's show Sir Dan. This one I haven't really protected them. I I didn't cover them with any kind of net. This one's open already. I think this is a dicrite, dicrite uh, hybrid. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is just an ordinary hybrid. Here's a ripe pod, seed pod. Mm -hmm. yeah, even this one too. Nice colors. Mm. <laughs> this one's a dicrite, I think. Mm. This one. Yeah. yeah, and and I think uh, we'll just go back and to this uh, hello salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll just go back to care since since yeah, Dan but... is showing showing that one. Um, mm. So that's your preference, right, of the white pot? Because we're seeing, or mm -hmm. uh, because aloe uh, yes. like cold, colder roots. Uh, yep. Yeah. I'll will I discuss it already about the oh, care wait. basic care. Uh, oh, let's Let's just finish. <laughs> okay, wait. Really. Let's just finish from Claire. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, a lot of people is, uh, are asking uh, when, is, when is the best time to harvest the seeds. Um, in my case, my greenhouse is uh, really windy, so uh, I encase them with a, with a mesh, uh, the mesh. seed pod. So, yes, yeah, so the seeds won't fly away. <laughs> <laughs> when it mm -hmm. gets windy, mm -hmm. so I have no time to wait for them to open one by one, you know. So I'll just put them in in a mesh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so that, that mesh, is like the one that you use for gifts, right? For for jewelry. Uh yeah, you can use, use yeah. that one. Mesh pouch, <laughs> pouch. Hmm. I use the one that. Uh, found in Japan home or I don't know if it's available here but I usually buy it in Japan the the mesh that they use for the drainage mm, yes that's mm -hmm. what I use it's a stocking type mesh oh. and I hope Miss Claire you're selling that so that we can direct them <laughs> 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 Okay. So the question I would have is then then what do you do? Now you have the seed. Oh uh, now that I have the seeds, of course um I I keep <laughs> them. I, I just keep them in in a ziploc bag or a, a container before because I, I don't um sew them right away. Yes, that's I what I was for, getting at. How long? Mm -hmm. I wait for um, a few couple of weeks, probably. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes uh, up to a month before I sow them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Question: uh, Will it affect the viability of the seeds if you uh, will, uh, you know, uh, sow it uh, uh, a few weeks after you harvested it, or you just uh, sow I, it? Uh, I like to right age away? them. I like to age them a little bit, mm -hmm. and I say age them about a month is what I wait generally because. I found that the, the germination rates when they're green, when they're not, not fully dried mm -hmm. out, sometimes mm -hmm. the shell on the outside doesn't want to crack open with moisture. It just sits there and waits for it to dry out first. So mm -hmm. I find the germination is better when I wait about four weeks. Mm -hmm. after, after they're in this stage, you know, where, where they are right there, another four weeks. Okay. But you, everybody has different ways than... I would say with any bit of advice we're given here, there's no one right way to do it. There's people are going to have success and failure doing other ways as, as much as we have. So. 
Mm-hmm. And then we, I we think have it's, a... it's faster here because it's hot. Hot. Because <laughs> 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 it's hotter in the Philippines. So. Yeah, I think we, when it comes to, I think we need to um, clarify that definition of hotter because it's also hot in the U.S. But the difference, oh, yeah. the difference that we have here is we have higher humidity. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas in the U.S. they are hot and dry. <laughs> Here, and, we're sort of hot and wet. So, and it's cold at night in the U.S. Right. Here, it's kind of warm at night. Yeah. yeah just true. a quick question. Uh, if if you are not going to uh, sow it right away, there's a question there. For how long you can uh, you can store the seeds, or do you put the uh, desiccant or whatever if to you, keep- uh, you know? If you keep the them dry, I, I've had good viability for a couple of years, but I, I wouldn't count on it much lo- longer than two years. All right. Wow, that's so. Yeah. yeah. That's for Miss Gail Niango. Niang- Niango. Yeah. But again, the key is there, if it's moist and humid, they might start germinating in your package somewhere. And if you're putting it in a Ziploc bag, that's moisture containing. And a Ziploc bag would hold moisture it's conceivable they could initially start to germinate and then yes. die because the, the 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 humidity in there. So so that's a concern. But if you keep them dry, I think you could probably do it for two two years or more. Mm-hmm. And then the other option is if you dry them thoroughly, you can freeze them. Mm-hmm. That's a it's good kind of thing smart. because um uh, I I usually keep them when they are really dry. I don't uh, get the seeds when they're still uh, green. The seed pods are still green. I wait until they are really crispy dry before yeah. I before you keep, pull them off. I keep the seeds. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So, Sir Dan, um, I think we're ready for you. Okay. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> the best for last? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Definitely no. <laughs> So, so for that bring it on. Uh, so usually the one thing that's being asked uh, most of the time is the soil mix. Uh, so let's start with that. Uh, we usually use pumice, uh, pumice compost. Uh, you can also use cocoa peat. Uh, the aged one is better. Uh, it's it has less tannins. We also mix uh, carbonized rice hull. It's the uh, rice hull that's been turned to charcoal. And then we add in uh, this type of fertilizer, Osmocote, or the brand is Osmocote, is slow-release fertilizer. And then uh, here in the Philippines, it tends to get really hot. Uh, the sun, uh, we're in the middle of the equator, so the sun is intense. So we recommend using white pots. So it would help in uh, at least uh, not heating up the roots of the of the plant, uh, just like this one. So uh, keep it, keep the mix uh, a little bit more well draining because it's humid. And especially during the wet season, you have uh, uh, weeks of rain, and we don't have uh, any sunlight during those times. So it's better if you could uh, give it more drainage or aeration to to prevent rats. And the pot should be should have good uh, drainage too, just like this. So that's uh, the uh, basic for for repotting uh, bare rooted plants. Uh, for for seeds, oh, let's stick to the mature plants. So we usually put them under some kind of shade, about twenty percent to thirty percent, depending of the depending on the kind. Uh, those that burn easily the, the lighter or variegated kinds we put them under some shade and 
what, what uh, on a more uh, aerated uh, location of your uh, uh, area. Uh, and uh, watering, for watering, we usually water two to three times a week, depending on the uh, weather that day or week. Uh, sometimes we have really hot days, so we water them often. And for some uh, gloomy or very humid days, we just water a week or even once in two weeks. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, any questions so far? What, what aloe is that? Ah, this one I forget the <laughs> forget the species. I think this I came think also. Alometry for me, Marigata. It's not a hybrid, right? No, it looks like yeah. noblest to me, which would be Nob a cross between Mitriformis and mm. uh, distance. It's, so it's yeah, a it's, hybrid. It's, mm. It is, and it's a variegated yeah, hybrid. Hybrids. And oftentimes, mm -hmm. when you have hybrids. Um, you do get variegation because the uh, way, mm. way it comes together. Hybrids I are, the variegation is often an indication of hybrid hybridity. Mm. Doesn't mean that all hybrids are very, um, are, are <laughs> hybrids, but. Yeah. Yep. But are, are there variegated species out there? Are there variegated I mean, what? Naturally occurring variegation on species. Yeah, I showed one in the program. Mm. Yeah, a micro, mic, uh, microstigma in the wild. I've seen lots of plants that are variegated in the wild. Mm -hmm. I saw one on Socotra, Alloperii, was variegated, a very nicely mm. variegated one. So variegated that it was so beautiful that I wanted to take it home, and you can't do it. So. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. yeah. We, have a, we have a question, um, Dan. Um, can aloes tolerate... Uh, a bit more organic component, maybe 60 to 40. Yep. Uh, so if you're keeping your collection under some plastic shade or roofing, uh, I recommend adding more organic mix to it because uh, they not, not like the mix for cacti. So these ones, we usually mix 50-50 uh, mix. 50 for the pumice and 50 for the organic uh, part of it. Looks pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. so, but you uh, know what? It's kind of like cooking. There's a thousand different mm -hmm. recipes for the same thing. So it, it's what works for you and, and what works for your environment. And clearly it's working well for mm -hmm. him. Dan's got a good good little operation going there. <laughs> yeah, it's a talent uh, factory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, for the basic care, that's that's how we take care of them. And then for the seeds, uh, seedlings, uh, we usually transfer them about this size, uh, about uh, three to four, three to four leaves. This is just our uh, just uh, maybe a first, second batch of our seedlings. And this is how we've over, oh, we've uh, placed too much seeds on this spot. A little bit enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, we didn't expect them to be this, uh, to have Get a high germination generation. rate. <laughs> Can I answer a question that I see on the, the live chat? Somebody said about storing the seeds in the freezer. Mm -hmm. What I was talking about is that I would not prefer to do that. But if I were not going to sow them and I wanted to keep them for a long time, if you dry them thoroughly, you can deep freeze seeds in a seed bank manner. I don't yep. do that normally. I, I usually sow it in a year or maybe less. So if mm -hmm. I'm growing something, I'm I'm constantly growing it. And I, I don't like systematically store my batches yes. of seed because you're going to lose some by by freezing them. Mm -hmm. But but if, on the on the other aspect, if you put something in suspended animation, you might be able to keep it there for four or five, six years if you wanted to grow it that way. So that was what I was trying to get to. If mm -hmm. if you don't dry your seeds enough and it keeps moisture, and then if you put it under uh, freezing temperature, the moisture in the seeds would crack the seeds and kill it. 
Crystallize it, exactly. Yep. So dr dryness, desiccant is the important part. And then the only reason to do it would be to like do a seed bank like we have at the wild animal park. So if you have a rare species of aloe and you want to keep it for a while, you can store the seed. I, I don't see the viability lasting forever, but it, they've, people have done that kind of stuff. Um, but I do not, I, I, I do freeze pollen though. And I've used pollen up to four or five years and had it work. Right. Okay. And we have a question here. Um, what's the most challenging part of propagating growing aloes from seed? It's after germination for me. It's uh, when you germinated them and then you don't have a good uh, estimate on when to water again. Uh, for me, I water when they germinate, I water. Uh, just uh, lightly on the top layer and then wait for a week again to water. Uh, keeping the germinated seedlings is the challenging part for me. Okay. And you, we, don't do, we don't do close germination for, for aloe. Yes. For me, yes. That's... Uh, uh, that's uh, I tried putting them in under a humidity chamber and uh, when the temperatures spiked up i i cooked them i cooked the seeds yeah like a little <laughs> mi microwave oven yeah <laughs> so now we just grow them out in the open uh, under some shade now we couldn't do that because we don't have the humidity because they dry out I mean, we, we grow them in a seed house and it's a greenhouse with higher humidity that's where we start them um, but you're absolutely right. Everybody's going to adapt to whatever their environment is. You have the humidity. So by encapsulating them in, in a bubble like that, you basically cook them, as you said, sweat heat them in, in little bags. Internal temperature of those bags could probably, you know, exceed 100 degrees. Yeah. Nice Castellone. Uh, this one came from Altman Plants. Uh, when when my friend's uh, brother-in-law was buying it, okay. they were only allowed to buy two plants per person. <laughs> I think they're okay. letting you to buy up to nine now. Oh, it's it's not different now. <laughs> need the restrictions. But it's nice, it's nice to, to know. I <laughs> yes. see a picture of that in the wild, too. It's a, it's a beautiful it's a nice I, I saw your post. I actually shared your post about the history of Castellón. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't name it. I didn't, I didn't find it, but I, I mean, I didn't mm -hmm. find it originally. But I've been there, and it's, it's a beautiful place. A wonderful, wonderful. Aisle. We really enjoy those history and background about those plants. Dan, what's your favorite? Uh, what's that? Which one's your favorite? Uh definitely the uh, aloe polyphila and the plicatilis. Oh, very good. Those are my favorites so far. Not a favorite seedling yet? Uh, this one, uh, I have some few TT uh, kinds, <laughs> but these are just some practice. <laughs> it looks good. Practice, practice runs. Nice. Uh, so what but this one's about? definitely, okay, I I mixed in some humilis on this, maybe, mm -hmm. and uh, some of your hybrids. Nice. <laughs> and some of uh, other uh, breeders' hybrids, too. There might be a winner there. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> uh, there are some compact ones. So I usually encourage my fellow fellow uh, collectors to try breeding because it's better and it's more challenging to compete with uh, your <laughs> uh, best looking hybrids. I'm sure you Sorry. guys will out outdo me in no time. Oh, you we are way, way decades ahead of us. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I I'm running low on juice here, and I moved to the other room so I could be more quiet. Um, how much longer are we going to do this? Yeah, I think we have like uh, uh, ten, 10 minutes more. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm down to 5%. If I, if I just disappear, you'll know why. <laughs>
It's it's okay. So we, we have uh, one more question for you, Sir Dan, before we proceed with uh, Miss Claire. Um, so is it true that soil mix can influence aloe growth to be more compact in form? I think so. If you, it's like the bonsai effect. If you limit the nutrients, it won't mm -hmm. grow too wide and too big. So if you limit it with food, it, it would grow more compact. I think. Agreed. And, and water as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then after Benguet, we're going to south of the Luzon Island to Miss Claire. Miss Claire, what do you have there? Claire, welcome to my greenhouse. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm just, I'm just gonna show you some of my. I don't know how to flip the yeah. cam here. Go to the gear icon. Uh, the gear icon you have there on the screen that says cam and mic. Okay. Okay, okay. and then click the camera, and then you have an option there for the back cam. I oh, hear you. Go. Okay. Okay, <laughs> there you go. So um. Here are just some of my uh, hybrids that I'm working on right now. Uh, this one's my favorite because of the texture. Nice. Pinkish. And um, I, I'm just going to show you the what I'm talking about earlier. This, this is the mesh bag that I'm using. This is aloe casti. The mesh. Castillo. This is the mesh bag that I'm using. As you can see, they're all dried up. And lots of seed. I haven't pulled it out yet. What I do is just cut uh, I just cut this and then harvest the seeds. Yeah. There. And I think the casting uh, only that you have there is the smooth one, right? I would say that's yes, a, hy a hybrid. Uh, I think that's the owl. Castellone. Yeah. It's a hybrid already. Yeah, it's nice. It's a, it's I definitely a hybrid, I, I but it has, definitely has Castione mm. in it. Yeah. Nice. There. <laughs> so I'm gonna show. Nice benches. What I have, I have one hybrid here that turned um, crispata. Wow! Nice. Wow, that's so nice. cute. Yes, it's it's a really slow grower. Um, as you can see, how long has that other... been growing? This was um, I saw this November ten, twenty nineteen. November ten. <laughs> it's still yeah, that small. Already. Mm -hmm. Wow. Or probably it's already that characteristic of that uh, new plant <laughs> that it's just going to be that. <laughs> it's a mutant, actually. So um, here is where I grow my seeds. I have uh, actually it's triple net. I have the net here and here and. One more here. <laughs> Triple net wow. for the seeds. Oh, how many how many seedlings in one pot? Thousand. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> I think this is uh like uh up, I don't know I didn't I didn't <laughs> maybe two hundred seeds per pot. Okay. Oof, that's a lot. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because yeah, I'm okay. using really big pots. Can, Do you, you have help them potting them up? Excuse me? Do you have help potting them up? <laughs> that took uh, a lot of work. No. <laughs> yeah. This one. Yeah, that's a lot of work, actually. I have smaller ones here. Maybe this or just 100 seeds. Oh, wow, this one is nice. Looking nice. Promising. C can you show us some of your mother plants? 
Okay, mother plants are here. <laughs> <laughs> My greenhouse is a mix of because I I started with um echeveria, yes. So yeah, I also have a lot of them. Here are my mother plants. Wow. I have my, this is my biggest uh, aloe DZ of Karen Zimmerman. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I I don't have a lot of uh, species yet, and most most of them are aren't flowering yet because they're still small, like this. Suprafoliata. They're still small. Nice. I don't think they're gonna flower anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so are, do you have anything else you want to show us there, Mom Care? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show how. But okay. Maybe next time I'll, I'll, I haven't prepared the mix yet. I should be showing the how to how I uh, sow the seeds. <laughs> but <laughs> I I forgot to prepare the um, the things I need. So <laughs> I'll just show them next time. Okay, cool. So I think uh, so. Dan, you still have something there for us? Oh, all right. I'm just going to show you some seeds of uh, aloe prostata. I don't know if you can see it well. I'm going to ruffle it. <laughs> oh, yes, the ruffle. We can do that maybe after. Uh, ah, I mean, so the, it's the seeds, no? Oh, no, the these seedlings. are the seedlings. But uh, the seeds, uh, I'm going to show you later. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I'm just gonna show you. This is how the seeds would grow af after you sow them for the alo olomatophyllum prostata. It's kind of dark, uh, monochrome. <laughs> mm -hmm. There. So that's for the raffle. Oh, that's cool, pop. Wow. <laughs> No, it's for the seeds. <laughs> the seeds. <laughs> Not the seedlings. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. That's awesome. So I, I think we pretty much have um, covered a lot of things. So thank you. Thank you guys for everyone. I know yeah, that uh, you. you might do something else. So before you, you go, guys, so Kelly, do you have any last words for your Filipino fans and to your fellow Alo enthusiasts? No, thank you for having me, and I appreciate it. And feel free to ask questions. I I can be reached anywhere, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> right? Yeah. Thank you. One short anecdote. Thank you. I've, I've asked Kelly out of nowhere. We're not friends on Facebook. I just shoot out. <laughs> And trying my luck, and then luckily <laughs> I was noticed, and then he agreed. So thank you so much for your generosity of your time, um, Kelly, uh, and for sharing it with us. So we're looking forward to more discussions with you soon. <laughs> we'll be in touch. <laughs> nice okay. meeting all of you, and would like to know more about the questions and stuff. But good luck, and hope it was some help. Yeah, and then by the way, the only Thank you. the only thing that we are remaining to do is the question and answer. Uh, sorry, not question and answer, but the, oh. <laughs> so I already have um, list down some of the questions I have here, um, so that we can give it out to our um, winners. So the mechanics of the raffle is just whoever answers the question first. So we still have Kelly on here so he can validate if what I wrote down is right or wrong. <laughs> oh, good. Somebody, okay, so I'm telling you, somebody from the Kelly Griffin group will probably tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> then, um, so whoever answers first will win our first prize. Brixio, what's your surprise? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, since... Uh... Dick Wright is one of the 
favorites of uh, Kelly. So I'll be giving away this uh, premium uh, hybrid uh, Dikrite premium number nine. Wow. So, but not the, the not the mother plant. <laughs> 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 Just on offset. Yeah, I can give it to them. I don't know if they can see it. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. By the way, for, for I can give this. So yeah. Uh, so for for Brixio, um. We do have some conditions, by the way, to all U.S. watchers or to all watchers outside of the Philippines. Unfortunately, you cannot join us on the raffle, but Kelly might give you, might do a raffle in the U.S. territory. So. <laughs> oh, the pressure on <laughs> so we'll you. Go. Gotta give me some forewarning. I'm sure I could do something like that. Maybe when we do the agave, we can we can do oh, the yes. Wow. <laughs> oh. So so for Brixio, this yeah. first prize. This this first raffle for Brixio, he, he uh, we have a condition. It's only applicable yeah. for Metro Manila, right? Yeah, NCR, the National Capital, uh, uh, with National operations uh, with the operations of uh, Grab or Lala Move. <laughs> okay, okay. So the first question um, that we have is, what is the first known hybrid? Of Kelly Green. Oh my God, we're talking what? aloes. Yeah, we're we're talking about aloes. So, what's the first known aloe hybrid of Kelly Green? So, type in your answers on the comments box so that you can win the Dick Wright Premium Number Nine from Brixio Echo. Again, it's only applicable for the viewers that are in the national capital region. Okay. So yeah. first question. I think I got this from, yeah, from Sir Noy. And I think he's yeah. also watching. Hello, Sir Noy. Oi, Sir Noy. Hi, Sir Noy. <laughs> so no question, no answer. Oh my no God. Answer. <laughs> no answer. No answer. question. No answer to the question. What's the first? No, <laughs> no, no, you you would have thought. Oh, somebody got it. Oh uh -huh. yes. Wow. So, but unfortunately, I, I, you are not from NCR, Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> Miguel, Hi, you're not from NCR. Give sense to others, na man. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so we are not going. So, Miguel, I'm very sorry because we're not from the NCR. And then you got it right. So, <laughs> we are going to change the question. Sorry, I should not. I should not. I should oh, not somebody, else, somebody else now put it there. So, you got, you got a couple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we already, we already posted it. So, okay. we are going to change the answer. This time, add the question. This time, oi! He's in Manila though tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Will you accept? I'll leave it to you, Rexio. Baka hindi offset yung maibibigay ko sa kanya. <laughs> we'll so, talk about Rexio, it. So, is, is Miguel acceptable as a winner for you? Yeah, it's okay. But we can, okay. we can also choose another one. Okay, so wow, very generous, huh? <laughs> okay, so Miguel on one. So what's the next question for the another raffle? I'll leave it to you, Brixio. What's your question? Question. What's the next? So I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm 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 looking for a possible question actually. Uh I'm looking at my notes. Okay. So, oh, here I don't know if I I I don't think if this was mentioned, but uh, <laughs> and I don't think if somebody can answer this. So, what is the uh, uh, in college? What did uh, Kelly Griffin took as a course? <laughs> wow, I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> What's, so the I question, okay, I, I, maybe I can just revise, uh, but I'm sure that this was mentioned by Kelly Griffin. Uh, during uh, his uh, freshman freshman year, he worked as a greenhouse 
What? <laughs> See if you were paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. It's a greenhouse. It was mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Where is KG's dumpster? <laughs> <laughs> no answer. See, somebody played applied physics, and that was my main. Close. Well, that was pretty it's close good. to engineering. Oh, we wow. have a, we have a, we have the, we have the answer now. You have the right answer. I this think one. we have from Miss Cherry Fruit, Baltazar. Sherry, I'm not seeing. This one. Is he from NCR or Cebu? No, Miss Cherry, where are you from? We can only ship with the <laughs> NCR. So I yeah, two questions that I think could fit, because one is the greenhouse lab tech, and somebody got that too. Mm -hmm. My major was applied physics, though. I, I yeah, failed out of electrical engineering. Yeah. So wait. So Miss Cherry Fruit, where are you from? Yay, NCR. So Cherry Fruit got Hooray. it. All right. OK, congratulations. <laughs> Okay. Next prize for Brad. That's a, that's for Brixio. Thank you very much, Brixio, for your generosity in sharing that. And then we'll move yeah. on with Miss Claire. Miss Claire, your Hi. prize. My prize is in the office. <laughs> but I have the mother plant here. Because I brought it down a while ago. Here's the mother plant. It's Aloe humilis. Beautiful. It's nice clone. <laughs> it's uh, this one is from uh, Japan clone. It's a Japan clone. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Very nice. So for the question for this, I I can ship this anywhere nationwide. Yeah. But anywhere in the Philippines. Philippines. Anywhere Within in the, the Philippines, Philippines only. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, Miss Claire, for, for shipping, it's going to be shouldered by the buyer, uh, by the winner, right? Uh -oh. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So, what's the question? The question is, since since I love cats as well, <laughs> what's <laughs> Kelly Griffin's cat's name? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty quick. <laughs> what is Kelly Griffin's cat's name? He's yeah. a, he's a first, Russian blue. Yeah. First, if First you're letter. watching, you should know it. <laughs> Somebody got it. Pisco. Mm -hmm. Pisco? Pisco. That's correct. Wow. Congrats. Wilson. Yay. Wilson and Andrea. Congrats, Wilson. <laughs> you are the winner. Okay. By the way, all those who won already will not be able to can can't win twice, so we have to give way to others. <laughs> okay, so Dan, it's okay. now. What's oh, so question? so the price would be uh, the seeds of this uh, Nomatophyllum prostrata. Yep, and the question: uh, What apart from Castiglione, uh, what is Kelly Griffin's uh, go-to uh, breeding plant. One of uh, the th that's there. There was three mentioned. One one was uh, Castellon. What are the other ones? Some breeder. Do, do, do they have to give the two more or any or just one? One of them. Okay, we asked that question. Top three. Got it. There it is. Adrian. Oh wow. There. <laughs> okay, congrats. You win the seeds of this plant. I, Sir Dan, I think you have to change this, the, the seeds. What? <laughs> I think he, he got another plant of that. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, I think. Adrian Stop, already am I right? Plant. Are <laughs> do, you, do you guys or, know, maybe, or maybe or maybe he can just donate it? <laughs> you know the difference between lamatophyllum and and aloe because they've now combined lamatophyllum into aloe. But do you know the yeah, difference? Seeds. The seeds 
uh, fleshy, the fleshy compared, seeds. Fleshy seeds. It's compared to the yeah. normal. Yeah, it's more fleshy. Dehiscent it's, dry seed. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 never... it has wings. Yep. Yeah. Winged seeds. Yeah, generally the 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 aloe strict scents will have seeds that are dehisced in the wind, and that one has fleshy fruit that falls to the ground and kind of wash. Good job, guys. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so out. much. He, Thank they, you so much for joining us. What I want to see is is the results of your work. I want to see the, mm -hmm. the pictures of all the <laughs> seedlings of what what's come out of them. Oh, and we'll, if you we'll guys definitely share them. For, for other plants to breed with, let me know and I'll see what I can do.